It's now 7 p.m. I'll call the meeting to order. Can we have the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, please? The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, a slight difference in order in the agenda. If you watched it on uh, cable TV this weekend, we've got a uh, awards presentation being made by uh, a veterans agent, Larry Corbin. Larry. Good evening. Thank you for giving me a few minutes to do this uh, presentation. As you know, the uh, town is involved, or I am involved through the, as the veterans director with the Route 9 Veterans Forum, which is a uh, cable network television program. The program started a year ago, July of 07, in Leicester. The producer is Bill Moore. I'm the co-host. We do the show monthly, and we alternate it between Leicester, and we alternate it between uh, Leicester and Auburn. We couldn't do the show without the help of both towns. We were nominated recently um, for a very special award, which actually Bill and I didn't think anything about it. Uh, we just kind of thought, yeah, we're new kids on the block. We're not going to get any awards for a cable TV program. But the cable show is a multitude. Um, it, it focuses on informing veterans and families of the core issues of health care, psychological needs, benefits, claims, legislation, employment, training. There isn't any subject we don't touch. We inform parents, grandparents, wives, everything. Uh, widows, everything, everything that goes on to do with the veterans. Uh, this show, the Route 9 Veterans Forum, which originates from both Leicester and Auburn, are completely 100% done independently by Bill and myself. We couldn't do it without the help of uh, Auburn Cable TV Network and, and uh, Chris Hugo. However, just to, to, to let you know that uh, the award that we were nominated for um, is the Rika Walsh Community Access Award. I'll let Bill talk about that. Bill? Thank you for having us here tonight. Uh, my name is Bill Moore. I'm from Leicester. Uh, we, Larry and I, uh, won the uh, 2008 Rika Walsh Community Impact Award. And what it was for, it was presented to us on November 15th, uh, 2008, uh, for generating a project whose impact spoke directly to a clearer understanding of the cause being championed. The content, whether modest or large, would reflect the passion of the goal because of the use of PEG resources, which is our, the cable access station, a greater empowerment of purpose and an appreciation of the value of those resources was achieved. The, no the Northeast region encompasses, and we were up against other people that were nominated for this award, Connecticut, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New York, Rhode Island, and Vermont, and they chose us. So we just, uh, Larry, if we, if we could call up uh, Chris Hugo, we'd like to present uh, him with a plaque for the town of Auburn. Chris. Chris, this plaque was given to the Route 9 Veterans Forum um, television program without which your help uh, we could not have been as successful as, as um, it became. Right, we, were, we were totally surprised to receive the award, uh, especially since we were competing against all the big other uh, independents. So thank congratulations you. Thank and thank you. That's for you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you. He's a gem. I just want to thank uh, Rich Hedden and uh, Alice Brommels, our principal camera operators, who have been working with us. And um, i got to run back to the station now. The, <laughs> it's acting up again. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thanks for the time. We appreciate it. Uh, Larry? Sir? Uh, from what I understand, all these shows go overseas, too. Am I correct on that? Oh, yes, sir. We are... Um, we are now in 80 uh, different towns in the Commonwealth on the cable networks. We're in eight foreign countries, including Moscow, Beijing, Kosovo, Saudi Arabia, the naval fleet in the Persian Gulf, uh, Bel uh, Belgium, Germany. We are now worldwide Iraq. in Iraq. We're on the Internet. You can, you can go to Route 9. That's RT9. 
Veterans Forum, and you can pull up all of our TV programs for the last year. Um, and we're pretty proud of that because we started out with two guys from nowhere in the kitchen, and now we're worldwide. <laughs> but I, uh, I talked to some guys up the VA, and they asked me, asked me about the show and if I'd known you and more. And I says, Thank yeah, you. I did. And uh, they really they appreciated overseas because, I don't know, unless you've been overseas and you've got nobody there and you really don't know what's going on with the town, what's going on home, uh, what's with your home and things like that, and you'd be surprised what this will do for the guys overseas. Thank you again, especially for me. Thank you, Carl. It's, it's, a, it's an honor to work with the vets. You know that uh, we do this, you know, with our hearts, too, so thank, thank you. you. Uh, next item on the agenda is the minutes of uh, October 27th. We have a motion to accept. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. There's a vote. Also, minutes of November 3rd. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. There's a vote. Yeah. The citizens' comments. We have Edie Dow. Thank you, all you gentlemen up there. And the lady. Um, how many minutes do I have? Five? Three. Three. I'm going to make it in three. That's it. <laughs> oh, that's not fair because I said I was never coming back here. But, okay, can I? <clears throat> I, ha I know this is not the weather for this, but after my neighbor across the hall came over and said, 80, you want to read this? Fighting the bullets on the Auburn News last week, I said, okay, so I read it. And that brings out the good old cemetery again. I wrote a letter asking um, Cemetery Flowers over the years, excuse the gum, it's my, it's my security blanket. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not watered on a regular basis. How, how, now the mums are dying because of no water. Why is that? And the answer from Mr. Bloomquist was, the flowers are not watered on a regular basis because it depends on the type of weather that we have. This summer was rather moist most of the time, so it wasn't necessary to water as often as a dry summer. The CIP for employment, I mean improvement, there is some money that I plan to hook up a new sprinkler system in the veterans flower bed. I'll try to read this really fast. Like I said, I didn't want to come here, but if she hadn't given me that, I'd been fine, right home. But after my neighbor gave me this, I read you the letter that I wrote, and he answered. This answer is not acceptable to me, and I hope others in Auburn. Um, you people go to the veterans on Memorial Day. I assume you don't go any other day unless there's a funeral or something. You look all around under the vets and you see hundreds of plants. Count the dollars there when I'm sure the veterans, and I know at least six up there that were my friends years ago, they wouldn't care if there was only one flower up there as long as we didn't forget them. Not the flowers, the veterans. You all should go back in July when the weeds are bigger than the plants and the flowers are withering from no H2O. There were eight sprinklers, I count them, a long time ago, right over the vet's garden. And they did work because I used to water the flowers sometimes when nobody was around. But you have to go down and get the handle and turn it on because it's in the ground. They worked fine then. You have to turn them on first. Many, many dollars are wasted at Hillside every year. Hundreds of dollars. I watered, and he said that we had, he had a moist summer. Well, I took care of the senior center's garden all summer, and I watered about every four to five days, otherwise they would have died. And so did the people with the gardens at Packetrug Village. Do the residents, this is my last line, guys. Do the residents of Auburn know about the two newly paved... Mr. Hammond, are you listening? Of course. 
Do the residents of Auburn know about the two newly paved roads at the cemetery? Who paid for that? Thousands of dollars are wasted. It wasn't needed. And some of the roads like Pakatrog, for instance, are some places a very washboard. Shame, shame on the cemetery. And it's a cemetery, it's not the White House Gardens. In a 40 mile radius, I have never seen such waste as Hillside Cemetery. I know that there's no flowers growing now, but there will be. This is for the selectmen, because if I read this, I'd probably cry. Thank you, Reed. Thank you. <clears throat> See, now, that already took a couple minutes, right? <laughs> Right. Okay, next, uh, Laurie Lancio. I just wanted to um, let the people of Auburn know what kind of decisions have been made without anybody knowing the full circumstance. I was able to get a copy of Mr. O'Connor's new extended contract. Um, I understand there's a 2.5% increase in his salary, the additional vehicle expenses, but reading through it, we're also going to pay for uh, indemnity liability insurance on his personal vehicle. We're going to pay $100 a month towards disability insurance, um, pick up his health insurance policy, um, reasonable payments for a $500,000 life insurance policy, but we're in a spending freeze. We haven't been able to fix the heating system, obviously, in this building, because it's like Florida. And we're, we're allowing all this extra spending to go on, and people in the town hall think they might get laid off. And I just think this is a great misjustice by our board. We voted for you to represent us to do what's best for the town of Auburn, and you're approving all of this additional spending when people are wondering if they're going to have a 32-hour week, a 40-hour week, if they're going to have a job next month because we're in a spending freeze. And I just think it's very wrong to keep this a secret. It was never discussed in public. It was done in executive session. Nobody knew about it. And I, I think this is another example of what the people of Auburn don't know that they should know because it's our taxpayer money that's paying all of these expenses, and I just, I feel this is not right. Plymouth is upset because their town manager is gonna get a three-month severance package. Mr. O'Connor is gonna get a 12-month severance package. It, it just, it's so out of balance that it just, it floors me. And I think the people of Auburn need to know the whole truth and not just the little particulars that they wanna put in the newspaper. Thank you. Anyone want to make any comments? Or? Uh, moving on uh, for uh, on public hearings and presentations, we have an application from for the change of name of the Auburn Lodge of Elks on 754 South Southbridge Street to Auburn Webster Lodge, number 2118. Uh, the reason for the change is, is the uh, combining of the uh, two lodges into one, both being under the same uh, lodge number as the present. And uh, Mr. Coakley is here this evening, who is the uh, manager at the Elks. If anyone has any questions regarding the, the uh, change, license change. Move to open the hearing. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. <coughs> hearing is now open. Uh, Larry, do you have any comments that you want to add, or I mean, Bill? Excuse me. No, I think it's pretty pretty cut and dry. Any members? Close the hearing. Uh, okay. Any any people in the audience have any comments regarding it or questions? Okay, there's a motion to close the hearing. Second. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we have a motion to accept the change. We'll approve the change in name. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 It is a vote. <clears throat> okay.
Okay, and agenda item 5B, license uh, renewal hearing on Chieftain's Package Store. Uh, we just received a letter uh, that was added to our packet this evening. Uh, the writing with regards to the package store, uh, due to health issues, our family has been able to operate the business. We have been aggressively attempting to sell the business, however, the economy has not been on our side. The liquor license is a vital selling point and would drastically decrease the saleability of the property if not available. This has been in a family-operated business for over 80, 65 years, supporting our family and largely contributing to the economy of the town of Auburn. We would humbly request the additional time so as to secure a pending sale. Uh, do we have a motion to open the hearing? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. It's now open for comments. Board and board members. Mr. Westman. We have any idea how long he's looking for, or can we do it legally and then just extend it? Through the chair, this letter came in late this afternoon from the family asking for a hold on any uh, disposition by the board. Any other board members have any questions? So, so as a follow-on to Carl's um, um, question, then, I, then, then we can assume then there is no, there's been no opportunity to seek, um, you know, some advice of whether we can legally extend this. Uh, um, correct. Yeah. Through the chair, it was late this afternoon. I believe it was just dropped off, and uh, I would say it was in roughly three o'clock. I know. Can we uh, continue for two weeks, you know, the next meeting and just tell them, hey, you know, this is it. You, you have to be here to explain what's going on. Oh, wait, yeah. oh. 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 Do I do like to come forward to the podium? <coughs> I'm Cheryl Kemp. I'm one of the listing agents with Keller Williams. Keller Williams Realty, and this is Mike DeGillis, also co-lister. Um, the buyers, I understand, are here, and we're ready to move forward, but we do need, this is a real vital piece um, that we have for the sale, to continue the sale of the property. Mike, can you? We have it under agreement, but we just need to be able to secure the license so we can tra the transfer of the license in order for the sale to continue. Sir Connor, do you have a closing date scheduled? We can close as soon as the license transfers. The title can transfer for the property as soon as the license is transferred. Do we have anyone representing the current owner? Uh, his sister is here. Good evening. Um, here, I'm Bobby's sister, Mr. Conroy's sister, uh, Patricia Conroy Burns, and um, I'm here to, in behalf of the business and the license to be sold. Uh, asking um, if the license can be reissued. Uh, both Bob and I are medically unable and have been for the last three years to operate the business. Um, I had a stroke and um, I am medically retired by my doctor, and certainly um, my brother uh, also has medical issues. He had back surgery, and um, which is not conducive. He has arthritis. He walks with a walker and a cane, and Medically, neither one of us are able 
to operate the business. Uh, and not being able to find anyone competent enough to take our place so that we could oversee it. Um, we have had to uh, close the doors. And um, I came here today uh, to ask that you consider the transfer of this license because of the economy, we've had a hard time trying to sell uh, the business. Uh, but now it looks like things are going to go through. But we can't do it without the license. Okay. Is the prospective owner present here this evening? The uh, buyers? Yes, yes, they are. Okay, because. Uh, <laughs> An alcoholic beverage license, the, the, uh, whoever might be buying it, it's, it's not strictly an automatic transfer from, from one ownership to the other. They have to uh, clear, I believe, the ABCC. Uh, they have to have a clear record and, and so on in order for them to be holding a license. So that would need to be checked prior to the, uh, the op approval and the sale. Understandable. Is there, uh, what do you recommend for us uh, to do? Can they, can they uh, recommend or send in the application forms to ABCC prior to the sale? Mm -hmm. Isn't that the request you have is for more time pending a sale. No. That's what the request is. I'm just is. trying to give them advice as to what, what to proceed with. That's what the... Okay. Well, what your letter requests is to have more time for the sale, and then you can clarify what what would be necessary, uh, what you'd have to accomplish before you could uh, complete the sale and and uh, have and have the uh, license transferred to the new ownership. But there is the, there is paperwork that has to be approved by the uh, state. So the letter this evening is asking for an extension of time. See, at your last meeting, you were talking about a cancellation. <clears throat> to consider cancellation of the license. At our last meeting, it was there was it was scheduled for cancellation because it hadn't been renewed. If you have an impending sale. Uh, and the people are going to take over, I would think that you would include that in the sale. And what you should do is to pay for, if you have not paid for the license for 09, I would think that you would want to make that whole and secure the license for 09 and then proceed on this additional time that you're asking for with the, uh, the sale of the business. And whatever you've incurred in the expense of the license, you'd charge that to the to the uh, new ownership. Okay. Um, for 2008, the license has been paid for. Yeah, 2008 is over. We're in right. 2009, we're due at the end of November. 2009 has not been paid. That's what I'm saying. So okay. I'm suggesting that it, that be paid. Okay. To make it whole, Mr. O'Connor. Mr. Chairman, I, I believe there may be some outstanding tax issues that put chieftains on a REAP list. REAP is a Revenue, en Revenue Enhancement Act, and I believe that the collector has advised there may be some outstanding tax issues that need to be resolved, too. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that that is also a part of the sale agreement. Um, and I'm probably not qualified to answer that question straight out, but um, having been an absentee for the last 10 years or more, but um, I will uh, certainly take that up with my brother and uh, perhaps maybe uh, the real estate agents can enlighten you better than I can on what 
is part of the deal. and continue. Okay. Uh, can I turn this back for a moment to uh, the people that know more about the agreement than I do? Would oh, that what, be you, okay? You've asked for additional time to secure a pending sale. So uh, if the board so wishes, we Move can to close the hearing. Motion okay. Second. Second. All Move those, to those in favor? Aye. 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 Move to okay. issue 90-day extension. Okay, that's a motion to extend 90 days. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So you have a 90 day extension to work everything out. <clears throat> I thank you very, very much. You're welcome. Uh, in behalf of my brother and uh, everyone else from the past, thank you. Thank you. The next uh, 7.30, I think we're just about close enough. Uh, we have enclosed uh, as a petition for a joint pole location on Laurel Street on the, on the uh, northerly side, approximately 850 west of intersection of North, North Oxford Street and 40 feet north on existing pole number 7. Uh, to place a new poll 7X. Uh, a representative from the petitioner should be in, sentence, in attendance to have a motion to open a hearing. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Yes, go ahead. I'm Steve Tricon of Verizon. And um, basically what's happened is the uh, customer at, <clears throat> at the location has since um, purchased a home and they had to uh, re- Revamped the electrical system in the house, and therefore the new the house the ser electrical service needs to be fed from the other side of the house. And per Mass Electric's request, they want us to place that pole so they could feed that house with uh, electricity. And um, after looking at the piece of property, there's also a vacant lot right next door that if they were to build, we would have to place a pole anyway to feed that so we're kind of looking at it as a you know future perspective to place that pole to feed the uh, current house that's in, in existence with the new uh, electrical service and it would give us future growth for the vacant lot that's right next door I think what you just said helped me understand the, I was looking at the drawing that was submitted and it it had a new look pole location and then it had an arrow that said future down to the lower right, and I was afraid you were saying in the future we're going to move that pole. All you were showing me with that future is that you will service the a yes. new house in that vacant lot from that same pole location. Yes, sir, that's Thank that's you. correct. <clears throat> any other comments from board members? Any abutters uh, that here that have any comments? Motion to close the Not hearing. Motion to close the hearing. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, do we have a motion to approve? Move to approve the location. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 This is a vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, to the chair, I'd like to make a motion that we move up uh, 9G. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. This is a vote. Agenda, <coughs> agenda item 9G is the uh, charter bill uh, number... H5155. Uh, there were several uh, corrections that were made by the, I believe it was by the Senate, wasn't it, not the House? Uh, uh, they're, they're aligned on the uh, charter that we sent in to, uh, uh, that was voted on by town meeting and the charter that was sent in to Boston uh, asking that these changes be made. Uh, the changes uh, 
once made uh, does not have to go back to the town meeting. Uh, it can go from us back to submission to the uh, the House and the Senate. For, uh, the House already approved it, so I don't know if it has to go back to them once we do the changes or it just has to go through the Senate. But the changes that they've made in there, if anyone has any questions or went through it over the weekend, Mr. Hammond? Yeah, what specific changes were made? The, how come, I thought at town meeting they said that only clerical, they, they reiterated that, that only clerical changes could be made, and now we're being told that that's not the case? No, the, most of the things are, are based on their illegal, the illegal uh, portion of the, uh, the Senate. Uh, they've stricken some of the lines they feel that they're not necessary or that a seven be a, be a seven and not S-E-V-E-N and so on, yeah, yeah. things like that. There isn't anything real major uh, that I saw going through it. Do you have any comments, Mr. O'Connor? Mr. Chairman, uh, this was received. Um, town Council has endeavored to speak to the person who emailed it uh, back to us uh, and uh, is continuing to do that and there's some confusion at this point at Senate Council's office I think the original email came out from an assistant secretary of state he wasn't aware of any concerns uh, so bottom line is Bob is still trying to resolve any issues that they might have Bob Hennigan as the chairman said a lot of it has to do with pronouns he and her she and him um, things like that that would be viewed as clerical or scriptness uh, corrections I have given a copy of this email to the Charter Commission Council's advice is any corrections would only need to be made at this level there's no requirement to go back and delay it any further with the town meeting action that could be done here I would suggest to you, you hold it until we get more information from town council. He was endeavoring to, to find the person who was doing the corrections. One thought might have been that some of it came out of Senator Augustus' office. As you know, Senator Augustus is no longer in office. So we're trying to get to the bottom of it. Mr. Hammond. Um, Mr. Mitchell came in, I think it was last meeting on the meeting prior to questioning the legality of the sewer section of this. Uh, I know we took a vote to postpone, but has that been addressed at all by that anyone knows of? No, because this board did not take any action to go forward with that. The House did not pick up on that, nor the Senate? I don't, I don't believe so. If I may, Mr. Chairman, there is on page 13, um, First paragraph, it makes mention of any conflict or, or with any, um, any other special act or law. Um, so it may come into play on page 13, paragraph 1. They're looking for uh, some revisions. As you can see in the middle of the paragraph, this sentence may need some revision. So if they're using that in terms of uh, maybe any conflict with any special act that has been adopted uh, by the legislature on behalf of the town of Auburn, then this would satisfy that requirement. But we don't know what they mean by this, and that's why House Council needs to uh, be town council. Give us some guidance as to what their intent was here. What about page nine, paragraph one, two, three, four, five, section 308? Uh, some qualification needed here to allow for council to be retained for purposes unrelated to town business. Do we know what that means? No, complete mystery. It but seems yet, it be, seems to be referring to the fact that departments be allowed to retain council for purposes unrelated to town business. I don't think there's any intention on behalf of the Charter Commission to constrict department heads from using council for private business. So that that is very difficult for us to explain. It just seems to me like those, you may be brought up, uh, Ms. Kasinovich, in this, these seem like more than just clerical issues <laughs> that, that is, yeah. was reiterated at town meeting time and time again. So I, I question, I, I, I'm personally questioning how, you know, at town meeting we said it over and over again that only clerical changes can be made. And I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but this looks like a lot more than clerical changes. Um, 
with this and uh, well, the, the if, just to clarify through the chair, you're correct. No, nothing more than clerical could be done in submitting it by the board of selectmen. Once it goes to Senate and House Council, I don't think they feel constrained by a vote of the town meeting. Mm -hmm. These are changes that have that have an emanated from somewhere. We think in Senate Council. Uh, they did not come from the Board of Selectmen right. or from Town Council in submitting the legislation. Yeah, I, I, I understand that, but you know, it was my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, that Bob Hennigan said once the town <clears throat> votes, if the Senate rejects any of it, they reject all of it. They don't make recommendations on changes or anything. And I and think it, that's what he's trying to get to the bottom of. And this looks like he's making recommendations on changes, including clerical, which... In so I'm trying to reconcile both, both pieces of advice from the same attorney. One saying only clerical, and then now we're saying, well, maybe there is some latitude for some changes outside of clerical, because, you know, these two sections alone, uh, lead, it's more than clerical. It's not a capital letter. I don't disagree with that. And I think this one particular one that... Uh, you're pointing out about qualification needed here to allow for council to be retained for purposes unrelated to town business is a complete and utter mystery yeah. as to how government or a charter or a mass general <clears throat> law or an act of the legislature could control how a town employee retains council for private affairs. Mr. Bell Hill. That's agree with Charlie on that second one. That's that is a total mystery. We don't know, understand what they want on that. As far as the first paragraph there, which I don't have in front of me because I just gave mine um, to John O'Day, um, that one is exactly what we have in our charter now. So I don't understand what their question is when they've already approved it and we've had it in our charter, um, and they want they got a question on that whole paragraph. Mm -hmm. So you know, until we can get some find out, number one, who did these changes. And number two, uh, the reasoning behind it. Uh, so we have to postpone it tonight and then move forward and, and then see where we have to go with it mm. once we get these answers. Dr. Gribbins? Yes, and I, I mean, I would, I would agree with all of this. And, and, and there are many other instances as well where they're questioning about sentences requiring clarification and revision. I mean, these are substantive changes. I mean, striking the word shall repeatedly. I mean, I know the word shall means a lot in contracts for lawyers. Um, these are substantive changes, so I think we also need to understand now, do we, do we have to accept these as well? I mean, that's a further question. Through the chair, if I could, we received this back. We wanted to put it on your agenda. We wanted to make the uh, Charter Commission aware of it as soon as possible, make this board aware of it, and get a report from town council. I can only tell you that he's endeavoring to get to the bottom of it. And as soon as we have that, I would suggest that we hold a special meeting as to not allow any further time to elapse uh, for your vote on the, any changes you might want to go along with. And, and, I, and I guess, Mr. O'Connor, to, to uh, um, Attorney Hannigan, is, is also just un, to understand whether we need to abide by these recommendations. Some seem like they're, they're saying this needs to be changed or deleted. In other cases, they're just, just asking for clarification. So there's different levels of comment here as well. Because if we have to accept these, then it's a different charter than the town meeting voted, and we're going to have to communicate that to the voters, which is going to be terribly confusing, that this is not the charter approved by town meeting, and some of these changes are potentially uh, significant changes. Well, that last paragraph changes everything, depending on how they rewrite it. could invalidate a lot of the home rule stuff that we've been put in. Um, so... But I'd like to know how we have differing opinion from the same attorney. That really concerns me, because I remember what I heard. He said only clerical could go. It was an up or down vote by the Senate, and now it seems like I'm being told that, well, if they're qualifiers, we can let those slide, which is something totally different from what was told at town meeting. Mr. Russman? No, no, we're not going to get any place. I think we should uh, <clears throat> continue it for a couple of weeks or whatever time it takes for us to have Charlie, uh, somebody get a hold of an attorney and, you know, bring it back to us. You know, even it has to be a special meeting. At least we can get it done to find out. You know. I don't even think we should put a couple of weeks on it. I think we should 
Should uh, uh, Hannigan get in touch with whoever was the originator here, get together okay. and get some clarification Something and so on, and then schedule a meeting as soon as possible? Yeah. Someone will make that in form of a motion? Yeah, so we'll we'll second. Motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Under item six, under appointment, appointments and resignations uh, and committee vacancies, the board continues to advertise for members for the Traffic Advisory Committee, the Youth Commission, and the alternate, al alternate delegate for Central Massachusetts Regional Planning Committee. No applications for either of these have been received. Uh, Agenda item 6B, part-time dispatchers. We have a memo from the police chief and the recommendations. A motion will be in order to, uh, can we have the chief come forward rather than my reading going through it? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would ask that you uh, make the appointments as requested. Uh, pending a successful background investigation and uh, all required testing as as usual both individuals are here should you uh, have any questions but I believe I detailed uh, all the pertinent information in the memo that I directed to you in the recommendation it's to appoint Nicole Claudia and Nicholas Varnos as part-time dispatchers uh, subject to successful background investigations and uh, so moved. Second. Uh, any discussion? Mr. Hammond. How have you gotten by without him? I'm and, sorry? Uh, I think it's been, what, two months since we did the, the guy left, then we promoted approximately two months. How have we gotten by without these two positions in the interim? Well, when we have an open shift, it automatically defaults to overtime. Um, as you may recall, you appointed a part-time dispatcher from Luster. It's a very difficult and complicated job. Uh, she worked two shifts and she quit. So um, it's full-time dispatchers that had to fill any uh, any vacancies, whether it was sick vacation or uh, or what have you. In light of the hiring freeze, are these absolutely necessary in your opinion? Uh, define absolutely necessary. Um, we're $2.2 million short of a budget. Cuts will be coming. I have reservations of bringing on new staff when I'll be telling people who've worked here for 25 years that their hours may be cut. It's not against the individuals or anything like that. I understand the, um, the need for dispatches. Um, it's a very vital job. They're kind of like the quarterback of the police department, so mm -hmm. to say. Um, we've had discussions privately of their importance to the town. But it's going to be, like I said, 2.2 2 million is not going to be easy to come, and cuts will be coming. So I, I, I'm trying to justify in my head how we hire new and then have people with 20 years on the job ask them to take a pay cut, less hours, or something like that to offset costs. So with that, I mean... Well, we, we have two dispatchers working per shift, um, and we have enough dispatchers to cover each and every shift. As soon as someone is out sick or someone takes some of their um, contractually, uh, the time that they're contractually entitled to, uh, you take, take four weeks vacation, multiply that times eight, dis eight, uh, eight dispatchers, uh, each and every one of those shifts is filled with overtime. Right. We budgeted $180,000 for our overtime. We spend an average of 220000 I think if we want to try and make a dent in the uh, 220000 mark, it makes sense to fill them with uh, people that are making uh, far less than time and a half. Uh, just for that number of weeks, that doesn't include uh, sick days or personal days. So it's it costs a lot of money to, uh, to maintain the communication center with... Uh, with the staff that we have. Mr. Westman. Uh, you know, like me and Nick don't agree all the time, but on this time here, I have to agree with the chief because, uh, like you say, the backbone of the police department is the dispatches. 
And if you take a look at the dispatches, I know because I had uh, some of them come to my house when one of my, uh, my daughter's uh, baby was sick. And that dispatcher was A-OK. -okay. She got the uh, cruisers up there, got the ambulance up there. And it takes a long time to get these dispatches trained. And if you don't have good dispatches, we can be in a world of trouble. So I uh, agree with the chief. We need what we need. What about, what about if we, um, i just ask you, I'm not making an emotion, but what if we appointed one position and then kind of waited to see what the governor does with expanded night sea cuts? Probably what, within, I mean, we'd have a much better picture in a month or so of what we're looking at. Um, less than that. Less than that in terms of whether or not we could afford them. I understand the need, but I also understand the need for police, teachers, firefighters, code and for I mean, everybody has a need, and we get the budget here, and, no, you know, but, you know, I know everybody has the need, but eventually the cuts are going to be coming, whether you believe it or not. So I think some people don't believe it yet. But So it, would you be open to an appointment of one and then a delay on one until we have a better information regarding the actual cuts we'll be seeing in the future? I, I don't think that, that I look at part-time dispatchers as, as a position. I, if I could hire 15, I would. I think I look at part-time dispatchers as individuals that are going to save us money. Uh, we don't pay them benefits. Uh, they, they come in and, and work less than 20 hours a week. They, they help us. They save us money in, in the long run um, by not appointing two. Or if I had four that were qualified, I'd be recommending four because it's it's going to save us four times the money in the long run. I think, to me, it makes no sense to appoint any any number fewer than what we can get our hands on that are that are competent and, and capable. Um, the union might might not be be too too thrilled with that, but that saves us money. So no. No, it, 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 to me, it defies common sense in my mind. Mr. Weston. I make a motion that uh, we'll go along with the Chief's uh, recommendation on the dispatches, because I'm a firm believer in good dispatches. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a recommendation to uh, postpone uh, agenda item 6C. Agenda uh, item 6D, a special municipal employee. We have a memo from the school superintendent, uh, Mary Ellen Burnell, requesting that Eric Otteson be designated as a special municipal employee for the purpose of providing medical coverage at athletic events. Also enclosed is a memo from the fire chief stating that he has no objection. Uh, uh, Motion to designate Mr. Otteson as a special municipal employee would be in order. Um, so moved. Second. Yeah, okay, I was just going to um, make the motion. We have a discussion? We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye it is a vote. Agenda item seven licenses and permits. Drain layers license. We have an application from J.A. Polito and Sons of Shrewsbury for a drain layers license. Uh, so the commission has voted to recommend the issuance of the license. The motion be ordered to approve the license and provided that all requirements of the state, town, and any of its departments, boards, commissions have been fulfilled. So moved. No second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Here is a vote. Agenda item 8A, the highway surveyor. We have a letter from the highway surveyor concerning the snow equipment account. Uh, the board would need to vote to allow the highway surveyor to deficit spend in the snow and ice accounts in accordance with Mass General Laws, Chapter 44, Section 31. Uh, we have the letter before us that, uh, that uh, as of uh, December 26th, the account was in deficit of $1,595 as of today. As you know, uh, the way the budget is, is uh, planned, uh, it, we do plan to, to deficit spend. 
because of the way the the law, the state law reads. So that's why we're always in the in the negative. I, so. I, meant I, I move to allow the highway surveyor to deficit spend in the snow and ice accounts in accordance with MGL Chapter 44, Section 31. We we'll have a second. Second. Well, uh, discussion. Um, I don't know if you have these numbers offhand, Ms. Kasanovich, but you have the the. Uh, <clears throat> you probably don't. But the total snow, snow fund um, expense last year and the year prior to, and what was budgeted for this year? Um, I can tell you, I believe we transfer at year end for fiscal 08, 237000 We overspent the snow and ice account by, we budgeted 140, 141. Uh, in 09, we increased that budget by roughly $45,000 to 180. Um, I'd be happy to run a report and give you an update, although it may not reflect services that have been provided within the past week or two, because those invoices have not been processed and paid through our office. But I'd be happy to give you an updated report as of, a, uh, as of today and provide that to you uh, tomorrow. In your, in your uh, follow up to that is, can you explain the deficit spending process and how that works for me as well as other people like you deficit spend you budget 180 I think annually we probably spend closer to 350 give maybe 400 is that fair I mean we never spend less than 300 in any given year on snow removal um, all depending on the year all depending on the severity of the storm all depending on whether there's a FEMA or MEMA reimbursement that, that has happened in the past uh, I can tell you that some of the expenses that we have paid will qualify under the FEMA and MEMA um, application. We have not received that money yet. That deficit does reflect those expenses. So in essence, we really haven't overspent yet. We just don't know what that reimbursement is going to be. Uh, but because we've already exceeded those line item appropriations, we're forced to bring this to the board. The board has to authorize to <coughs> spend an excess of appropriation <coughs> under 4431. During the course of the year, or at the end of the year, to the extent that those line items are overspent, you can either cover that through any other available source that may be available, or the board would have the ability to raise that deficit on next year's tax recap sheet in the event that those funds are not available in the current fiscal year. So come June 30th, let's just say we have a quarter of a million dollar deficit. We don't have any funds within the operating budget to cover that then our projected deficit going into next year at this point would increase by a quarter of a million dollars. Mr. O'Connor. I just want to add to Mr. Hammond that a year ago when we were preparing the 09 budget, we looked at the history of the snow and ice accounts. And as you know, first of all, there's a premise that you are allowed to deficit spend there as opposed to any place else. But we didn't think it truly reflected the history of what had been spent, so we tried to increase it. It was a significant increase, not in terms of snow and ice, though, in terms of taking money from other departments, other expenses, and, and allocating it towards snow and ice. I think we should try to bump it up every year as <clears throat> revenues allow so it more accurate, accurately reflects what the true cost of snow and ice fighting is. The last point I want to make is this December 26 memorandum would be inclusive of that ICE event of the uh, 12th of December, which there is a meeting shortly. MEMA is hosting a meeting on the reimbursements, and we'll know what we might be entitled to at that point. When I said to run for this office, I sat down with just about every department head, including the highway surveyor, and went over budgets and any information they wanted to give me. It, it's my understanding that when we present the budget, and if I'm wrong, correct me, please, that when we present the budget to town meeting, it's balanced. But it's really only balanced on paper. And the reason why is because we all know that we funded that snow budget by, what, 50% of what we know on an average storm will use. Uh, every year that I've been paying attention, we always deficit spend. It's so we can't say, well, this year is bad. Well, every year seems to be bad, so how come we haven't gotten up to the average? With that, 
we have two options. We can take from other accounts, rob Peter to pay Paul, or we can continue on the deficit spending. Either way, it doesn't sound like a sound long-term financial plan because although when we look at the accounts, we have all those police positions that previously weren't filled, money allocated to them, and on paper at, at the beginning of the year, that money's there, everyone, in, everyone who's paid attention to that budget knows that half of that money's going to go to cover the deficit of the snow account at the end of the year because it's got to come from somewhere. <clears throat> You do this over and over again, and now we're finding ourselves in a financial shortfall, whereas if we actually had a true budget that did not require deficit spending, we probably wouldn't be facing a $2.2 million shortfall. Um, I don't think it's, I mean, I understand why it's done. I get the concept. It's the only account we can deficit spend in. So if we look at the past three years' history, and I believe looking at last year everyone was over 300,000 and I think we appropriated 141 850 this is going I mean I'm remembering from a year ago but I think it was 141 850 boom 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 three years in a row and every year the account spent over 300,000 which means even on the average winner we're, we're $160,000 deficit spending so where's that money coming from well we didn't fill the position of this we didn't spend money on that so we'll do a transfer at the end of the year and make that account whole. Am I wrong yet? At the beginning of the year, those positions, whether it be police or any other vacant position, are funded with the intent of filling those positions. With the intent of filling them. But, and I understand that. But at the end of the year, we didn't fill them. So we take that money and we offset the deficit in the snow account, which we knew. I mean, you can ignore and pretend you didn't know, but... You have three years in a row of over $300,000 of spending, and we're level funding the snow account for three years in a row at about 50 to 60% of what the average of last three years were. You know you're going to deficit spend. It's like putting 100 bucks away for a car payment that you know is going to be 200 bucks every month and then acting surprised at the end of the year when you have to take money out of your food budget to cover the difference. Um, so we'll be leading. And now... When I made my recommendations to move on, when I made my recommendations to identify the open positions that were not filled this year and roll that money over to next year to help offset next year's proposed or projected deficit, some of that money will be used to cover the deficit. Any money that is available at the end of this year cannot be rolled into next year. The, the law does not provide, pro provide you. You have to spend that money between July 1st and June 30th, unless you have a liability that you incurred as of June 30th but have not paid that. You don't have the ability to roll that over and use it for next year's appropriations. So where does it go? It closes out to free cash. And then that money comes back in, though? It may come back in if, in fact, you have um, free cash to the extent that you're allowed to spend it. Right, so it there gets been, certified there, and then it will roll back in eventually. there have been years when we had negative free cash. So, but eventually, if you have a surplus, it will get rolled into free cash, and eventually we'll come back around. And, I mean, we have free cash of $1.2 million now. Correct. Where did that come from? That came primarily from estimated receipts that came in $600,000 $600, stronger than anticipated. So when, when that money comes around, we get it. We eventually, I mean, if we tax, I'm missing something here. If we tax... And we appropriate money to this position at $40,000, and we don't spend a penny of that. Where does that money go at the end of the year? That closes out to fund balance and ultimately ends up in a certification of free cash, whatever that may be. So let's assume that everything was budgeted. We have $40,000 left over. There's no deficits in any <clears throat> account. That 40000 goes to free cash for certification. Once certified, we'll come back into the revenue source. Right, but it's offset by a number of different components that feed free cash. It's not strictly just surplus appropriation. You could fall shy on your collections, whether it be state, right. estimated receipts. So that's what I'm saying. Assume all that comes through. I mean, The receivable offset, if your collections are down, that comes into the calculation of right. free cash. So in other words, if our collection rate goes down because of the for whatever reason, because of the uh, fiscal constraints of the uh, um, economy, um, that's going to be a reduction against your free cash. Right, because we have to offset those, those deficits. And what we're doing by doing the snow, snow account, in my opinion, is just adding another deficit to be offset. I mean, 
Am I wrong in saying that? That the deficit needs to be offset by our own? You don't have to sweep those surplus appropriations against that deficit. You could choose to raise it on next year's recap sheet. But because it's available, and we don't know whether it's going to be available or not, we talked about the surplus for those positions at 350, and a portion of that money, if those positions are not filled, could be used as an offset against the snow and ice deficit. It does not have to be. But it, it generally is. But I think you would want to clean that up so you're not relying on taxation or some other funding source in next year with the uncertainty. Well, you don't want to roll it in. Out. But my question is, why don't we just budget enough for it from the beginning, other than just expect to deficit spend and then roll it into free cash and then offset, or use money that was allocated for positions and then roll it in to I, offsets? Why don't we just do it right and just budget 100% for snow and budget so there is no deficit spending so it doesn't kill Darlene's budget? And that because every year, generally, due to deficit spending in the snow budget, we end up in a spending freeze. Not this year because of extenuating circumstances, but every year, generally, not this year, like I said, we go into a deficit spending in, in, in uh, snow and ice, and then everybody gets shut down. Please fire everyone. And I'll tell you right now, not being an accountant, that if you look at the budget and you look at the last three years and what we appropriate, we will deficit spend, forcing us into a spending freeze eventually. Mr. Chairman, a couple points. First, the spending freeze went in before the snow. No, froze. I'm not talking this year. I'm right. talking. I, I just prior want to make years. sure that the public understands yeah. that that, talking that prior happened years. long before. Right. The last point I want to make is, we put a 40, roughly a forty-five thousand dollar, forty-some odd thousand dollar increase that we brought into this body a year ago, for FY09. That's a thirty-some odd, roughly thirty percent. That can give you the, the precise increase in that line item. I think that you are absolutely right that that line item should better reflect the reality of what occurs by experience in this community. But all I could afford to do, and, and not easily, was jack it up by roughly 30 percent. If we could do that again, I would prefer to do that so that it more realistically reflects what the needs are for snow and ice, and not have a false what I would consider to be a false number. On the other side of the equation, it's the only line item where we have, under Mass General Law, that flexibility. But if we can grow that annually, I would prefer to grow it. To go beyond that 40-some-odd thousand, I would have had to look directly at a payroll account when we did this a year ago for FY09, the current year. That's, uh, you summed it up perfectly. At the beginning of the year, you can look at the payroll account and say, you know, we can't afford to fund this payroll position because we have to fund the snow and ice. Now, we don't do that. Right now, we say, well, we're going to leave the position funded. Let's see where that snow and ice deficit spends, and then we'll take the money out at the end of the year. It's the same result. It's just a matter of... But we're not, we don't hold on the hirings of any jobs pending the weather. That doesn't happen. I can assure you of that. I no, know, we go into I, spending freezes. I know where that has happened, but that has not been our practice. I understand that, but we do go into town-wide <clears throat> spending freezes because of the weather. We go into town-wide <clears throat> spending freezes usually in the last quarter or from the second half of the fiscal year, and on occasion it is because of, uh, of uh, what has happened with snow and ice accounts, but there have been other considerations as well. We have had vacancies held in some departments because of, of uh, large legal bills or large litigation bills per that department. So some of those have been swept, some of those budgeted but unfilled positions have been swept to cover le legal expenses in the past. And the, and the board has been part of that. I understand that. I just want people at home to get understand what we're doing here is at the beginning of the year, the budget we're setting and that's snow and ice. It's designed to deficit spend. So people should not be surprised come this time of year, maybe sometimes even earlier than now, that we're deficit spending in there because we are underfunding that budget. And if we could increase it another 30 some odd percent in the budget preparation now, I'd be more than happy to do it to over a four or five year period, get it to where it more accurately reflects what Auburn's history has been in those accounts. 
and I think that would be to the high, highway survey as a benefit as well. I agree. I think she gets handcuffed. I think all, all departments are getting handcuffed by the way we're managing that account because once this freeze goes in, it, you know, not this year. This year is a totally different animal. But, I mean, at the end of the day, we're, we're still taking salary and we're paying that snow. But none of those freezes now or in the past have ever had an effect on public safety with respect to snow and ice fighting or police and fire. And even the current freeze, the POs that I do, if a truck needs work on a blade or on hydraulics or whatever right. it is, is getting done. I, I, yeah, I'm not saying that. I'm just, just saying make sure. at the end of the year, you know, the end result is the same, but we're lying to ourselves at the beginning of the year so we feel good. That's how I feel about it. But, cause but I, I want to say that that number cannot be corrected in one fiscal year. Physically impossible to correct it and, and show what it accurately reflects in one fiscal year. It can be done incrementally, it can be done over a period of time, and that's what I'd like to do. Dr. Rivens? Uh, two questions. One is of the money that's been ex uh, expended on the uh, rentals, is any of that going to be reimbursed because of the was it December 12th storm? Mr. Grimmins, uh, what do you mean by rentals? Which so so th this oh, is, under, under this, this line of equipment rentals, right? That's the way it was. That's the way it was characterized. That, that's right? for deficit as of twelve twenty six. Would that would that cover some of that storm? Yes. So some of that will be reimbursed, hopefully. That's correct. The monies that were put into FEMA are unknowing when they're actually moved to pay equipment itself. To and overtime is close to 10. Okay. Very good. And so that so some of that will be uh, recouped, mm -hmm. um, hopefully. And then secondly, you, you, you characterize this as the the, the rentals. Um, does this include then the rest of you? How's the rest of your operation in terms like sand and salt? That's not in deficit yet. Salt is in deficit as of uh, this past storm, approximately uh, four thousand. Darling, could you come up to the podium? Because the question that I asked you earlier this week to have the information this evening we're getting into. Uh, as of uh, this last storm, so prior to this weekend, salt is in a deficit approximately about $4,000. Uh, sand is not. Sand is, is probably about 98% spent. <coughs> And equipment rental, which would be private uh, high risk for plowing, um, is right now uh, probably about thousand dollars short. And how are we doing on overtime? Overtime right now is fine. Right. Okay, so that's basically the numbers that I had asked you for earlier this week. Is that is correct. Total is close us. to about seven thousand okay. dollars. What we would like, or what I would like, is to have. Uh, each meeting, uh, you don't have to be here, but we would like an update as to where we stand each meeting so we can let the public know where we stand. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I think we need a vote on that. We need a vote. Okay, good. Yeah, we had a motion and a second. Uh, we had discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 There's a vote. Uh, agenda item nine under new business, uh, municipal project submittal, the federal economic recovery bill. We have a copy of the submittal. Uh, just give you, uh, those of you who weren't aware, uh, last week uh, we received a, uh, a request from uh, Lieutenant Governor Murray uh, of a list of, of uh, Things that we would like to uh, submit for, based on the uh, uh, Obama's uh, recovery bill, and uh, monies that would be coming forward to the state to, to uh, set things in process for uh, to make out a uh, supposed wish list, if you want to, uh, for maybe a, a short explanation as to what it might be. Uh, you have that in front of you this evening, uh, and that listing uh, had to be in. It came to us uh, 
I believe it was late Friday. We didn't get it till Monday morning, and they were looking for answers back by uh, was it Wednesday or Thursday morning, Wednesday. which was before our scheduled meeting. So the list has already been submitted to the uh, State House, uh, and. It's for us to uh, to vote and confirm or, or to uh, authorize the uh, the list that went in that I had to uh, to sign on Thursday. Uh, if you might have read in the paper this evening, Worcester submitted for three hundred and fifty million dollars. Uh, our listing, I believe, was somewhere in the vicinity of what was it, one seventeen, one eighteen, one hundred and eighteen thousand. No, on million, that we million, put on the list. million, million, million. Um, eighteen million. So excuse me. <laughs> I left a zero off. So we would need a motion to uh, to approve that list, or if anyone wants to discuss what was on that list, the recommendation was made by not only town administration but the various department heads. Mr. O'Connor, Mr. Chairman, I just want to, for the board's benefit, and the other members walk through the process, and then I want to acknowledge the work of some people. Uh, this was sent out by Lieutenant Governor Murray's office on the uh, Friday after the 1st. We received it after a Monday morning meeting uh, at 11 o'clock. Uh, we had a department heads meeting right away. Uh, all the municipal departments, school superintendent, and uh, work commenced on compiling the documentation immediately. As you all know, there was a uh, uh, somewhat of a storm scheduled for last week. Um, with all the departments being diverted with all sorts of activities, uh, this was a major priority and um, was completed on time. It was electronically transferred to uh, Lieutenant Governor, uh, to uh, Representative Frost, Senator Moore, and hard copies were delivered uh, Thursday uh, as well to the various offices. As the chairman said, uh, well, as, as I would uh, clarify some of the chairman's comments, this is a, a, a statement of documented need from the community to the state. The, uh, the plan that is currently being worked on anticipates that federal funds would be allocated to the state for the Commonwealth to be involved with the disbursement as opposed to directly from the Fed to the community. So they asked for that assessment of need. I don't characterize these as grant applications, but needs and uh, the total of $118,279,622, approximately 25 projects. We advised the Lieutenant Governor's Office that the board would meet Monday night and we would send a confirming uh, vote down to his office on Tuesday. I move that we uh, authorize that confirming message to be sent with our thanks to all the team that pulled us together so quickly. Second. Any discussion? Just before we take the vote, there was an awful lot of work that went into this by, by uh, the administrative uh, portion of the, of, the, uh, of the town as well as all the department heads, and, and uh, we want to thank everyone for being <coughs> comfortable and getting all the figures in in time. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 It was a vote. Gift acceptances from the dog officer for Sunshine Club Medical Recovery at St. Vincent's Hospital in memory of Mary uh, Granlund, $50 for the kennel renovation project. The Council on Aging, uh, Home Depot, uh, Washington Street, Washington Street, Auburn, $300 for holiday decorations to be purchased at Home Depot. Uh, for the Council on Aging, George Fournier, 26. That can be the street. And Webster, $200 for trees and wreaths, wreath clips. Uh, the Council on Aging, Mike McNamara, $25 to the grocery voucher for elders. Uh, from the library, uh, Ryan J. Stelzer and... Mer Merlin, 
Uh, Glazer, $250 to the miscellaneous gift fund. And from the library, uh, from Betty Peterson of Worcester, $10 for the gift fu book fund account. Do we have a motion to accept with gratitude? Move. Move a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 There's a vote. Agenda item 9C, uh, the gas and diesel bid. I don't believe we have anything in on that as yet. Mr. Chairman, the bids were received today. Uh, we received one bid at this point. I uh, believe it to be non-responsive, and I anticipate we'd have to go back out. Any comments from board members? No. Okay, agenda item 9D, tax... Rate increase uh, requested by Dr. Gribbins. Dr. Gribbins. Yes, and I thank you, Mr. Chair, for putting this back on the agenda. Um, at, you know, as we've discussed this evening on a, on a couple of different occasions, um, the budget's extremely tight. I think it's unprecedented what we're experiencing right now. And like every community in the area, as you read the paper on a daily basis, I'm sort of maintaining an inventory of some of the discussions underway in other communities where they're talking about cuts just to accommodate the projected state cuts. And I, I'm trying to get my hands around and trying to understand um, uh, the, the, the wisdom of uh, Auburn uh, leaving untapped, you know, $737,000 of budget resource. Um, you know, as we're looking at this revenue shortfall and how this is greatly compounding, I think the challenge that this community is going to face, providing basic services. We're not, not talking about level, we're not talking about growing, but about the most basic services. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can have a continued discussion um, of this issue. As I brought this up once before, I, I think a lot of people were surprised that the the savings from this freeze amounts to less than $7 a month for the average homeowner. And as I talk to residents and as they're looking at where they're likely to be paying for this one way or the other, as you look at other community, communities where they're looking at, you know, restricting or closing libraries. And there was just an article in the, in the Telegram last week of how the usage of library increases during tough economic times, where, where people look to the library uh, to make up their needs that they funded on their own. Um, restricting the hours of the senior center, where school systems are looking at athletic fees, uh, but increased busing fees. That $7 saving is, is going to very quickly uh, disappear, and we're going to end up paying more um, in, in the long run. And I've, I've been doing some research, because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what drove this decision, and I'm, uh, and I'm looking at, and I was expecting to see that, you know, people are having, you know, and I, I don't mean to minimize the strain that we all feel in our, our home budgets, but you know when you look at the data in terms of tax receipts for 2008 to see if there was a spike in delinquencies, and we're as good, if not better, than we were the previous year. And we only have 12 outstanding uh, delinquent bills from 2007. So there doesn't seem to be you know, a, a, a real problem on that front. Uh, and this is across the entire residential, commercial, industrial group. Um, also looking at foreclosures in Auburn um, in terms of looking at and, and seeing, is it higher here than in other communities? And, and in fact, we're in a, in a better position than most of our surround, surrounding communities. And then you look at that, and, and even there, not to minimize, and, and I sympathize, uh, and my heart goes out to anybody who's, you know, who's facing a foreclosure on their, on their home, but it's not likely $7 a month is, is, is going to get them out of that hole. But I look at the pain that this $737,000 is going to cause the town workers where, you know, we've talked about letting go already this evening. We've talked about letting people go. And for a town worker to lose their job, they're likely to lose their home. Uh, we, we know if you lose it in a two-income family or one-income family, one of those incomes, you're going to have a heck of a time making that mortgage payment. So I, I'm very much concerned about, you know, the burden that that's going to have um, on the, the, the laid-off workers in this community and how that actually will have a significant impact um, on foreclosures. 
Um, also looking at, I know in my own budgeting, we're reminded constantly that uh, the, a layoff is not an, an, a net gain. You just don't realize those salaries. Uh, for every 10 people you lay off, you have to lay off an additional three people approximately uh, to pay for the increased cost of unemployment costs. And, and, and we've borne those costs in the past. And then you have to tack on to that. On top of that is, um, not to pick on the chief here, but the example that he gave earlier, is that in essential services of highway police and fire, uh, we, we will bear an additional cost of overtime. So as we budget and we try to deal with making up that, with that additional $737,000 shortfall and, and looking at making that up in um, layoffs, we have to think about that very carefully in terms of our employment uh, compensation cost, the increase there as well as how it might impact, and it's going to be very hard to plan for overtime cost, anticipating uh, that, that possibility. Um, the second point that I, I, I wanted to raise is another one that I don't know the answer to, but I, I know, and, it, and this is only happening in cities, um, that most communities are taxing near or at the cap uh, in terms of the towns, where you see them under the cap. Worcester, for example, is $11 million under their cap. Worcester right now is very much concerned about how that's going to be viewed by the state as they're looking for additional state resources when they're not taxing to their potential. So my question is, how is that going to impact as we're going to the state right now, asking them to re-examine the formula, and is, it is Auburn being uh, it, uh, funded properly by the state uh, in, in, in Chapter 70 uh, when we're leaving um, money untapped in terms of local resource. So Worcester, I know, is having a serious discussion about that right now. And, and, and again, it's unknown about what that impact is. Uh, but I, I think this, it is certainly some, something at the very least that um, we, we need to examine. And when you look at that $737,000 cap and you compare Auburn's total budget to the budget in Worcester, proportionally, we're actually leaving more money on the table than Worcester uh, in terms of the size of the budgets. And then thirdly, I, I, I looked at, again, we, we talked about savings of $7 a month for the residential. Uh, where we take a serious hit is on the, res, uh, on the commercial industrial. And, and just to give you one example, you take the five top valued commercial industrial properties in this town. The, the tax savings that they're, they're realizing this year by not having the 2.5% increase. Uh, for those five alone, for those five alone, is almost $63,000. That's enough to fund about one and a half police officers or teachers. That's what we're leaving on the table here. So as we're looking at cuts and what those five um, businesses alone are not contributing this year uh, to the cost of running this town, we're really talking about one and a half people. Okay, um, that, that's, that's a real figure. And then, you know, as we look at the commercial side of it, the commercial industrial side of it, um, one issue, and I'll bring it up just as an example, but one thing that I'm always monitoring, we ran into this in the last recession in 2001, but it's a cost that we need to be anticipating in the budget moving forward this year, is um, homeless vouchers, hotel vouchers for the hotels. We're very vulnerable to this because of the large number of hotels that we have in this community. Right now, the state homeless shelters are at capacity. They reached capacity last fall. Right now, the state is housing 500 families in hotels, 77 of them in Worcester. Okay? Worcester is nearing their capacity. Where do you think they're going to go next? So, and, and, and again, I'm very sympathetic to the plight of the, the homeless, and I, and I do believe they should have housing, but this is another one of those unfunded mandates. The state will give the hotel the voucher for the room, Okay? But they will not cover any of the costs borne by the community. And those costs can be significant because if there's children involved in those families, we're responsible either for educating them or if they choose for the first six months, if that family comes from Lawrence, we're responsible for half of their transportation costs to Lawrence every day uh, so that they could continue uh, schooling in their home community. Um, this is something we should have our eye on. Um, it, it's something that creeps up on us. It crept up on us the last time, and then we found ourselves trying to scurry about trying to figure out how we were going to pay for those bills. 
The hotel costs are going to be covered. They're, they're making their money. They're filling those vacant rooms, which they have plenty of right now. And, um, and, and I think we know from the last time, um, and Chief, not to put you on the spot, but the number of calls to those hotels go up on a regular basis. Uh, with disturbances and fights in the evening and so on and so forth. Once again, we, we bear the cost of that expense, but these hotels will not pay a tax increase this year to offset these costs. So that's just one example of, of many um, that we, we need to take a look at. And then uh, fourth item that I, I'd like to raise for discussion is do we really want to balance this budget completely when we have this opportunity at $737,000 on the backs of our town employees? Uh, myself, I'm bothered by this. I've negotiated the contracts with many people in this community. I know they don't make a lot of money, and to ask them to give up some of that to balance the budget when we have other options available to us, I don't think is fair. And that's for the average worker. I have a greater con uh, as great a concern, I guess I should say, that we also risk, and we should be mindful of this going into this, that we risk losing some of our most talented employees uh, who could go to greener pastures. There are jobs open at all managerial levels around this state. Um, and to lose that talent, we, we're in a situation right now where I think we have very, very fine managers in most of our positions. And I think we, we've seen the cost of not having good managers in the past. I would hate to lose any of those individuals because we're not funding their departments properly the way we can. So I'd hate to preside over a talent drain over the next couple of years. And then finally, it's been pointed out to me by town meeting members, ultimately, town meeting can allocate this money. It's, it's town, town meeting, ultimately, that sets the spending. So we can go through this period of, of budget uncertainty for the next few months, you know, planning for these uh, contingencies. And then on town meeting floor, this money can be spent, which throws the whole thing in disarray that we're scurrying about. Pink slips are going out in the mail. Do we want to wait to that last moment to, to resolve these issues when we can reopen that discussion now and, 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 and think about uh, whether, in, in fact, given the, the pressures that we face, is, is this a, a wise decision? So uh, I'll pause, and I, and, I, and I hope that, you know, I'm trying to understand where the other three board members are coming from on this um, in terms of addressing some of these issues. Okay. Go ahead. You want to go ahead? Uh, no, I just wanted to make one point. You know, some of the things, you know, the points you make are valid, but I think in, in stating that uh, we're going to be penalized because we're not taxing to the max is a scare tactic. And... Uh, I don't think we have any history proving that because you're not, you aren't taxing to the max that you, you're going to pay a penalty as a result of it, and then that shouldn't be used, and it's been used in other instances before. Uh, I think we should be held more wise and more prudent uh, by the state in the in the uh, in the control of our monies and expenditure of our dollars by not maxing to the to the uh, uh, dollars that are available to us and, and not having any leeway one way or the other in, in, the, uh, in our expenditures. Uh, but some of the other points that you do make you know, are valid and they're, they're a problem that are going to be facing other uh, towns and cities throughout the state. It's not, it's, it, we're in, we're in uh, an area now that we haven't faced probably in our lifetime or our parents' lifetime, uh, what we're going to be facing. And it, it, the matter of, of uh, this additional two and a half, half tax to the uh, levy limit is not going to solve our problem. Nowhere near is, is it going to solve the problem. It's just a uh, small band-aid to, to, uh, to some of the... Uh, dollar issues that are facing our, our uh, residents. I've had several people talk to me in the last week or so in getting their tax bills for the last quarter, and a lot of them were complaining of the gigantic increases in their bills. And there were some, yes, that had decreases in their bills, is because uh, every three years we taxed at 100 percent, and then there's, I believe, only 10 percent that are taxed on an annual basis that are updated. So. Uh, 
Mr. Grossman, if I could yeah. just respond. Um, I, I, and I, because I, I wouldn't want to leave the wrong impression, because I was very clear when I was talking about uh, the issue of taxing to the levy. I don't want to use it as a scare tactic. All I'm saying is that Worcester is having that discussion right now. Um, and, 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 and they're much more forgiving with cities than they, than they are with towns in, in this particular area. That's the only point that I was making there. And then the, the other point is when we're looking at, at a total, what, a $2.2 million shortfall projected well, right now? Um, I, I don't consider 737000 of that to be a Band-Aid. I, I see that to be a significant portion of that. You know, do the math. It's a very significant portion of that total deficit. It's not a Band-Aid. Mr. My turn. Uh, through the chair, Mr. Gribbins makes some valid points. Top five businesses were, what, 64,000? I bet you if we pulled the five highest paid employees, maybe one lives in Auburn, pays Auburn taxes. I bet you if we pulled the top ten highest paid employees, maybe two live in Auburn, pay Auburn taxes. In terms of state aid, I understand the Worcester comparison because it's a good comparison because we're dual taxed and we tax just like Worcester. Not like towns, but we tax like a city, which questions why the charter doesn't have a mayoral system like the city of Worcester. If we're going to be a city, we might as well just be a city, not act like a town, tax like a city. So based on our dual taxation, well, one, that's why it's 64000 and not 30000 to the businesses because we're dual tax. But two, if they look at dual tax rates similarly, then I would expect the same thing. Furthermore, with the tax, I mean, we've gone over this over and over. 14.86 is our net tax rate. If we were a single class rate right now, that would be our net tax rate. Nobody else is near that. If we went to a single rate, we'd be at $14.86 per thousand. Every other town is at 11. So even by not raising our revenue 2.5%, we're still being taxed per thousand, like 30%, 20 to 30%. I don't have the numbers on me, but about 20 to 30% higher than any other town around us who have single tax rates, assuming we were a single tax rate. So even though we're at 2.5% higher, we're not raising our taxes 2.5% higher, we're still paying like 20% more in taxes as a town, as a community. Um, we've never gotten an answer as to why. Why is that? Why is it? Is it the dual tax rate? Everyone says no, but nobody can prove it. But the only definitive difference between Auburn and all the other communities is we have a dual tax rate. But everyone will say that's not why, but nobody will say, give me any, any proof as to why it is, why, or, or explain that to me. So I think until we get on level with what other towns are paying, why should we keep raising our taxes 2.5%? Because we'll just grow faster because of the compounding effect. That has nothing to do with the current situation. Before you, before you go on, uh, with reference to that, we have requested through uh, state representative and state senator for a meeting to be held. Uh, we're trying to schedule it, I believe, for sometime this month. I already uh, to get together and, and to get an explanation as to why and get some answers. That, to would, that would be great we've headway. Had, we've, we've requested it several times several and times. gotten the runaround. Got nothing. Furthermore, we're going through a process here where it's very hard and, um, you know, right before dawn is always darkest, I believe the saying is. We just received a packet from just about every department head, which is probably why most of them are here, identifying what they could cut out of a budget. And it's greatly appreciated. Some people hit the 5%. Everybody, I think, said why it would be very difficult and what, where it would hurt. So this is all information we received because of these impending budgets. Otherwise, I don't think this has ever been put together before. If you could cut, where do you cut? And how, how long have you been here, Bob? Have you ever seen a report like this? No. But we have identified places to cut. 5%? No. But have people identified things they could cut if they had to? Yes. Have they also, have they also identified how it would affect their departments? Yes. Does the Board of Selectmen as a whole and town administration as a whole have a better understanding of all these departments, their budgets, how they're affected, where they see cuts can be made? This is all information that is just as valuable as the tax increase that's being proposed once again. This process needs to go through because this information needs to be found. Mm -hmm. This would have never been done if we just increased taxes 2.5%, I guarantee. It wouldn't have, we wouldn't have it. I propose this, we got it, it's a great tool, and we'll use this in closing the gap. 
The gap is $2.2 million. I've spent uh, several meetings with Mr. Kasanovich. I think we've identified $600,000 that could be easily, I don't want to promise anything, identified to close the gap a little bit without raising taxes. The only alternative I've heard from anybody else on this board is raise taxes. I believe Bill mentioned once a meals tax, but beyond that, I haven't heard of anybody flipping over the rocks and looking outside the box to figure out a way to make this happen other than let's just raise taxes. Okay, let's raise taxes. We're still 1.5 million short. Now what? You're still going to lose the management. You're still going to lose good people. You're still going to have to cut hours. Uh, it's still a huge cut, which is why I voted no against all these spending initiatives and new positions over the last three months, which is why over three months ago I asked for this report. Um, this, this, this needs to be an ongoing process. In terms of jobs, if you have one, let me know. Because I need one, and I don't know about other people in town, but I'm sure there's not many jobs out there, especially in my field of finance, because they're gone. Um, I've created a list of other alternatives outside of raising taxes. Raising taxes should be the last resort, not the first. Some people came up with some innovative stuff in here that I would have never thought of. I, for one, will not take a salary next year. I've made that pledge, and I'll continue to make that pledge. Um, the, only, the only four people in this town out of 700 employees, whether it's for the kids or public safety, that have actually said they won't take a pay raise or anything is myself, you, Mr. Valentine, Chief Wynum. But it's for the kids. It's for public safety. But I want my personal vehicle. I just, I, I, you know, I, I like to see the work together. With the $600,000 identified by myself, this is through no sale of land either, which we've also compiled the list of property owned by the town, which could be sold, which the town administration is currently looking at that could generate some serious revenues. This is defunct property. These are slivers, some of them. Some of them are worthless. Some of them have value. Some of them we didn't even know we owned. Okay? This would have never been done had this process not taken place. We'll be rolling into the GIC, and when we do, that's a potential $1.3 million savings. I understand it will not help the budget cut on this budget. That is true. But if we can identify and know that we will, we, we will experience those savings in FY11, between the, the cuts identified between Mr. Kasanovich and I and Mr. O'Connor, as well as some other maneuvering, and knowing that free cash has come in, we're almost there. But the question is, do the employees want to take the GIC? Well, yeah, there's cause for concern. There's uncertainties with it. I understand. It's not portable. Could be more expensive. Um, but to the employees, if your option is look at the person next year and tell them they're gone or accept GIC, what do you choose? My last and final point is, I don't know who Mr. Gribbins works for, but I work for the town of Auburn, the residents. I'm sorry, but I don't work for the employees. I work for the residents of Auburn, and I represent the residents of Auburn, not the employees with special interests. I understand town meeting can go ahead and increase the $750,000, uh, 30000 whatever it is, and if they so do it, then so be it. I hope they're very loud and vocal about their votes. I hope it's not one of those things where it's a special interest, you know, making hand signals from the table, telling people what to do, caucus out in the hallway, which I've seen in two town meetings that I've been to. I hope it's a true up and down vote. And I hope they identify themselves as to who did do that. So they too can be held to the same standard we have to be. And I hope they stay the whole meeting and not just make that vote and vote on other things that are special interest to them and leave, which I've seen as well. That's my response to Mr. Gribbins. If he has a response, I'll be glad to give him the last word. But uh... yeah, let's see if anybody else wants to. Mr. O'Connor. Mr. Chairman, I just want to point out <clears throat> to Mr. Hammond, we, we did have a very, I think, productive meeting. But that is not the first time that 5% cuts have been reflected in a budget request. It may be the first time they've come to the body, but we have gone through in the past where we've asked department heads to come to my hearing uh, with two budgets. And uh, one is a fallback position and one is what they preferred. We have done that internally previously. Uh, it 
perhaps is the first time it has been requested by a board member, and it's certainly the first time it's been supplied. But they have been done at administrative hearings when we go through the budget process. In fact, when budgets have been more or less normal, revenue years have been more or less normal, uh, there are many occasions where a department head is sent back to the drawing boards and revisited under normal circumstances. But I can recall distinctly the first Romney year, the first year of the Romney administration when 9C expanded was asked for and was granted. And uh, it seems to me that was the first year we asked for two sets of budget recommendations from the department heads to come into the hearings. So we have done it before. Thank you. <clears throat> Since the chair was uh, good enough and other members good enough to uh, allow us to t speak again about an issue that I, for one, was in the minority in because I don't think it's the right thing to uh, to cut this additional 730. Well, I shouldn't call it cut this to not raise this additional 737,000. Uh, I would just like to state that for me, if we were just focusing on the problem that we have to handle no matter what, which is 1.5 million. We're focusing on the fact that we know the economy's down, so that we have to plan on state aid being down 10 percent. We know the additional health care expenses and so forth are costing us more. So we know we have a $1.5 million problem. Uh, it seem, I believe that there would be better focus and a better targeting of how we're going to reach that $1.5 million. Uh, if we would just go after that 1.5 million and when you make it even larger by saying you're we're not going to allow a two and a half percent increase uh, it becomes uh, you know very difficult to imagine how it's going to work and still maintain services and so we do end up having long speeches about what it's going to take and whether you know pitting each other about whether we're for the employees or for, or for the town I mean the fact is I think we're all here and we all would spend every uh, all of these Monday nights uh, because we care about the town and in fact we're just approaching it different ways about trying to make sure we're doing the right thing and we can we can have different opinions moving forward but uh, I for one would just like us to be as quickly as we can to be focused on the cuts that we absolutely have to make at 1.5 million because I think at that point there's no longer any disagreement I think everybody in town knows we have to cut 1.5 million and everybody would be, my guess is, would be quicker to come on board and, s and add to what they could possibly do to help us cut 1.5 million. As soon as the Board of Selectmen independently says, we recommend not raising any more taxes and therefore we have to come cut 2.2 million, what's the incentive for everyone to come right on board there when you're, you know, when you're turning your back on a, on a possibility of 737,000, which means you know, a, a large number of jobs is what it'll end up meaning within the town. So, um, again, I is gracious of the board to allow uh, particularly minority opinions to be voiced again, and I appreciate that. Uh, I, I do, I do wonder, I do ask the question, when we will revisit this, in terms of when the selectmen will be involved in the process again. Uh, I hope the answer to that is not on town meeting floor. Uh, I'd like to know if there's any way that we can, because typically the Board of Selectmen just forwards a budget to the Finance Committee uh, and, the, and then we, we, we don't have a lot of interaction with the Finance Committee before town meeting floor. Um, I'd, I'd like to know if there's some way we could agree to work together to have some more collaboration happen before town meeting floor so that we're not there with town meeting members. Uh, looking to us for guidance, the majority of the Board of Selectmen saying just cut down to, to 2.2 million, the Finance Committee coming with whatever work they go through with all the many, many meetings they're going to have uh, Wednesday night after Wednesday night after Wednesday night, the schools having their unique independent view of, of what they'd like town meeting to do, and us not looking like town leadership but rather looking like three separate boards and just kind of all kind of bantering for the town meeting's vote. Uh, so. I'd like to ask if the chair could at least try to facilitate uh, some discussions with finance as we move forward and perhaps with the schools so that we can look cohesive and collaborative before we get to that May town meeting. Uh, before we make comments, didn't we go through this as far as having, like the school committee wanted to have a uh, you know, meeting along with us and the finance committee, not a committee but a just a, uh, a 
I don't know what you would call working, it. Working group. A working group and so on, and we were advised by council that, that that was not permissible, that it couldn't be done. As an individual, uh, you know, one of us could attend a meeting and bring it back to, you know, bring it back to other board members, but I, I don't see any other way of doing it other than us for having a formal joint meeting. Joint meeting. Yeah. Uh, so, so well, I right. should be clearer about that then. You know, I'm not looking to do anything behind the scenes. I'm not looking for any special groups to be set up. I'm looking to have collaboration, meaning that we'd ask the Finance Committee, even though they're very busy, once they get an understanding of what they'd like to do, that we ask for a joint meeting so we can understand their rationale, understand what they're going to come forward with. Um, now, likely some of these last-minute decisions are not made till the night of town meeting. So uh, I'd be looking for, you know, a, 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 setting a deadline, say a month before town meeting, to say, look, is the Finance Committee willing at that point, a month before town meeting, to get together with the Board of Selectmen and have a joint meeting and walk through their rationale for what their recommendation is so that we could understand it? Uh, if for some reason it turned out to be uh, requesting, that, requesting town meeting that some amount of taxes will be raised, we would at least hear that and understand that and just, and have time to determine you know where we uh, where we as a board would uh, uh, would stand on the issue uh, just before uh, anyone makes any comments uh, one thing that I would suggest to perhaps uh, Bill who was a board member and your wife who was on the school committee historically we haven't had figures from them uh, until the last minute. Uh, perhaps it'll be different this year and we'll have figures sooner so that the Finance Committee will have some numbers so that perhaps a month before town meeting we could schedule a meeting with them to go over the numbers. But they're the biggest, one of the biggest bodies, uh, are the biggest body in town uh, that controls the biggest amount of the budget, and, and uh, if we don't have their their numbers when we meet with the finance committee, it's for not. Yes. So, so who do you mean by we? Because the school department and school committee has always gone to the finance committee and giving given numbers well no, before but, town meeting. But you mean the board of selectmen? They haven't come to the board no, of selectmen. No, we've gotten numbers from the school committee at the last minute. Who do you mean by we? The board the of selectmen. The school committee has gotten numbers. And provided to the finance committee at the last minute. It's just or to us. Either way. The school committee is presented to the finance committee for the last ten years that I know of, and some of those presentations I made months before the town meeting. They've, they've, they were called by the Finance Committee just like every other department had. I agree the Board of Selectmen aren't usually part of that process, but there is a relationship long established between the Finance Committee and the school department. So then, yeah, Mr. Hammond? The charter clearly states that the school budget is supposed to be presented to the town administration prior to anything else. So the fact that it's been done for 10 years, it's been done wrong. What was the date that that was supposed to come? The school's supposed to present a budget. You put a date on it, Ms. Kasanovich. I think the charter requires the first or second Monday of January. Have you gotten it yet? But we did get a letter from the school department. Did you get the budget? No, we have not. No, you have not. So they've already violated the charter. Now, how are we supposed to manage making cuts and everything else when we can't get the budget on time? It's already been violated. I have a list of positions here that I requested, and these are all school positions. These are all brand new positions in the last three years. Uh, the letter we got when we asked for a 5% cut identified one position that was still open and said we'll pretty much deal with this later. Well, when is later? The budget was supposed to be in already. I mean, if you're, if you're going to do a level-funded budget, can you present it to the town administration? If you're going to ask for an increase, can you do it? And if you're going to honor the fact that we have a 10% cut, can you please present something that will reflect it? But, I mean, I, I guess I'm a little lost here because the, the, uh, the procedures on this are very clearly stated. And, and to act like we don't know what is beyond, is beyond me. It's beyond, it, I, I, I mean, we have been discussing this since what, October, these potential cuts? November, we started looking at it. We said, you know, I think I got a letter in October identifying these cuts of this report we just got received. So we've been looking at this in October in anticipation of this. 
but no, you know, uh, the the uh, school department has not, and still has not, and 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 pretty much said they won't. Mr. O'Connor, Mr. Chairman, I I hear what Mr. Hammond is saying about the school department's submission. I am not going to uh, uh, take a contrary position to that, but I I do want to say because the superintendent is not here, I think you all received a memorandum. I hope you received a memorandum last Friday from the superintendent saying that they had. Uh, uh, leadership meetings scheduled on their budget in December which had to be postponed because of the ice storm and they were trying to catch up uh, make up time for those meetings that were lost and in fact this past Saturday they had scheduled a budget meeting internally to which the uh, board and the finance committee were invited uh, and that they would submit the budget as soon as it was complete but they had expressed in that memorandum I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not uh, obviating the charter's requirements. But they had re had expressed in that memorandum that they tried to do it in December. Mr. Hammond, I think everybody knows how I feel about the charter. We bent over backwards when Bob was in the hospital with a heart attack to satisfy the charter requirements for the reorganization. I mean, I think we were in a worse position than Ice Storm. Um, I have the letter here, a letter from the school department that has identified $46,000 out of a $22 million budget to cut. These people with less than $100,000, a million have identified more than that. The people sitting in here today who care enough to come. Um, the chart is very clear on how this, this is probably supposed to be done. Maybe the Board of Selectmen haven't done it in the past. Maybe that's why we're facing a $2.2 million shortfall now. I don't know. I wasn't here. But in terms of being in part of the process, I mean, I've been in Eddie's office sitting with him. I've sat with Charlie. I've thrown out every crazy idea I could think of to cut increased revenue without hurting somebody. Anything I could think of. The only idea I've heard from this board is raise taxes. It's the only idea I've heard from anyone. I just, I, I, I'm at a loss. I mean, I, I, like proverbially throw up the hands. We're, we're bringing, so I don't understand why, when are we getting part of the process. Call Eddie and sit down with him. He'll get you up to speed. Mr. Westman. Uh, I get two things. First, I'd like to get the budget, because all I got is one page. I don't know everybody else. That's all I got is one page. They said they can save $46,000 out of their budget. <clears throat> you take a look. What we're trying to save, you know, it's ridiculous on the money that the town's putting up beside the school. And I'd also like to find out uh, when you guys are going to meet with the, you know, state to find out exactly what we're going to get cut, how we're going to get cut. Well, let me, let me clarify that last thing uh, because I think it uh, may be some confusing. The chairman and I met with Representative Frost and uh, at that point Senator-elect Moore. And both of them committed to work with us on that, on setting up that meeting. Yeah. That's the meeting that Bob referred to before, is hopefully later this month. Oh, okay, that's what I want. Right. As far as cuts in 09, the governor has expressed publicly, and there's been a lot of uh, stories about it, that he's going before the legislature for the authority to revisit the current local aid funding that would impact town immediately, impact all the cities and towns immediately. Thirdly is the issue of 10 that we're starting now, the preparation of 10, that I think is what Mr. Hammond is also referring to. So when you say when we get the number, as soon as we have numbers, we're going to bring them to the select board. Okay, because that's what I'd like to see. <clears throat> as going back before anyone makes any comments, I don't know if you want to do it now. Mr. Valentine made a suggestion that perhaps a one month before the town meeting that we have a joint, that we schedule a joint meeting with the Finance Committee to go over numbers this year. And we, regardless of what we do, I think that we should schedule that. Thank you. Someone would like to make that motion. So moved. Second. Uh, all, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 This is well. Mr. Hammond. I know we've been debating back and forth and I get loud and I get excited. Um, but the one thing that keeps coming back, that will not lose anyone's job. It won't kill anybody. It won't cut services. 
is the GIC. That is, no matter how you look at this, whether it's 1.5 million, whether it's 2.2, that GIC is the most crucial part to closing this gap. And I want to reiterate, it does not close it for 2010, but it entirely changes the way we approach it. And I believe with the adoption of that, we can get through this. I'm not making promises. We can get through this without a cut in services and hopefully a cut in payroll. But that is not up to us. That is up to the employees and the employees in their entirety. So as we sit here and argue to raise taxes to save the employee, if, if we get a yes or a no, on this GIC as soon as possible. This is the most crucial piece of information to know moving forward. And unfortunately, we need this today. With that, I move that this board ask the GIC Employee Committee to vote in consideration of adoption of the GIC by February 15th. I ask that this board appoint two delegates from the selectmen to sit with the employees to answer any questions they may have concerning their outstanding thoughts. With that, to also reiterate the importance of the adoption. If they don't adopt this... Can I second before you finish yes. the motion? Because I second, and I... I <laughs> you and I obviously disagree on a lot here, so I no. want to be real vocal about are you the kidding? fact <laughs> that, that you are right on that this is the one to push on, and this is the one to say, look, Rather than talk about cuts, we can we can find out whether the the employees are willing to work with us and uh, and make this happen and make this uh, uh, provide for a much brighter future. No matter you know whether it does end up being 1.5 or 2.2, this is a step to a much brighter future for everybody uh, in Auburn. So uh, I, I I wanted to just not second quietly, but uh, but thank Nick for his leadership on this particular issue. I'd like to just add one thing in regard to it, and I sort of touched on it before. We're in times that we've never been in before. Uh, we're not in experienced waters, and, and people have to understand that they can't go along and continue along the way they had in the past. And something like this is going to have to change. It's going to have to be accepted, otherwise it's going to mean the loss of jobs, whether they like it or not. So. They, had, they need to look, you know, if it's a matter of having a job and not having a job. Uh, you know, people are, uh, are uh, in some instances, uh, you know, bypassing, you know, increases and, and so on now just to keep their, keep their job. And uh, everything has to be looked at in a different manner uh, over the next couple of years, other than it has been in the past 30 or 40. I will have an extremely high, I, I will not support any tax increase if the GIC gets voted down. It doesn't even make sense to me. It's not, it doesn't make common sense to me. To, to put it on the burden of the taxpayer when there's an option for the employee to help, I mean, I can't support that. And I hope you feel, at least have some kind of understanding of why. You know, this doesn't cost, this is not going to be a deficit or loss of hours or loss of uh, services. This is, you know, I understand there's issues with it. Nothing's perfect. But in light of the situation, helps. Right. And it's huge. It's huge. I mean, it's it's. No, no, it's no, I mean, he's got a motion. So motion. when you when you, you that, well, let's, let's go ahead with that motion. And, and just in, in discussion, we have a, a, okay. uh, um, a uh, motion and a second, and, and I fully support it. And, um, and and the only option on the table is not a tax increase. Um, I, I think we're going to have to make a lot of the cuts that we're looking at right now just to deal with the 1.5. So uh, it, it, it's a mischaracterization to say we're only looking at a tax increase. And, and I, I fully support the GIC. And um, I, I think if we can get the groups to agree to it and we, we still need the tax increase to balance the budget, I, I hope that we would reconsider it. Um, it, it, it's not just for the town employees. The employees provide services and to, to every resident in this town. That's the reason why the employees <coughs> exist. They don't exist just to collect a paycheck. They provide incredibly valuable <coughs> services that we all rely on every day. It's not a special interest group. Um, they, they make the town work. So I, um, I, I fully support this motion. I recognize that we're likely <coughs> to make other budget cuts just to and, and there's going to be likely to be layoffs just to deal with the 1.5, but I hope we haven't closed the door. And, and if we want to let it hinge on, I'm perfectly happy to let it hinge on if the GIC 
is approved by people by such and such a date that we'll reconsider it. I'm happy to go along with that. I think that's open-minded. Mr. Hammond? I'm not saying I would support an increase, but I'll tell you what, it's a lot easier to look at a resident in a time of disaster like this and explain why you raised the taxes when you can rebut that the employees also turned around and saved the town $1.3 million so they could save their jobs. I think it helps your argument yep, agreed. across the board. So. I mean, it, it, because it's not going to address the issue for this year. And it I, won't, I, but I said, it certainly I, makes budgeting yeah, a lot yeah, easier. No, I, and I just hate to deal with those issues that we're going to face this year. And that's the only point that I was trying to make is that we're looking in out years uh, for the, the benefits of the GIC. And at the same time, we're looking at our contractual obligations are only going to increase in the out years as well. And we've got to pay the bill. Um, so we, we, need to, we need to keep the door open uh, to, to the possibility of that tax increase. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, any other motions? No? At this point? I'd like to be appointed to be the delegate, one of the delegates, to sit down with uh, anyone who has questions regarding yeah, it. Yes. To approach. Our GIC. Anyone? I'll do that as well. Okay, uh, Dr. Gribbins and Mr. Hammond will represent the board for the uh, GIC to the uh, respective groups. Great. Just to let, uh, we're going to get the... Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 There's a vote. Okay. Uh, we're going to get the budget from the schools, so. though. Schools, we're turning the budget over to the to the finance committee. Come to it should come to Mr. Casanova before anyone. So I would move that um, we send a letter informing them that they are late and to ask them to return it as soon as possible. Yeah, that's my hope. Because I want to see your budget. second on that. Huh? You, I think that was a motion. Yeah, that's a motion. A motion. Yeah. Second? second? Yes, yeah, second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Five to nothing? Okay. Uh, anything else on that issue? Okay, moving on. Uh, agenda item 9E, marijuana law. This item has been requested to be put on the uh, agenda by Mr. Hammond. Yeah, I'm looking for an update from the chief on this. I've read a tremendous amount. I guess as was just shown, we have uh, more burning issues than burning marijuana. But um, the, uh, the long and short of it is I would anticipate probably coming in uh, to town meeting in May with... Um, some sort of a bylaw. I, I have a, a draft that there's still some question out there as to whether or not if you create a bylaw, if this can be made an arrestable offense or if it's going to have to have somewhat of, a, uh, of an additional civil penalty to it. Um, I'm going to have to do some more research between now and then. I'm probably going to have to engage uh, Mr. Hennigan and, and get uh, his opinion as to which way we should, uh, we should proceed. But I would anticipate something uh, for the Maytown meeting. If, if that answers your question. Well, I have a statement I'd like to read regarding what I read. Um, I'm not looking for a debate here, so I'm going to read this. I'll, of course, let you respond. Sure. Um, this is for the people at home as well. As you know, the people of Massachusetts overwhelmingly voted to pass legislation decriminalizing marijuana by a margin of two to one. It's no secret that law enforcement has been a critic of this law since it was proposed. While I recognize there are certain deficiencies the people of this great state have spoken, and the law does not legalize marijuana. But as of today, in Auburn, for all intensive purposes, we have very publicly have. The chief, an outspoken critic of the law, has made national news, moderately, by stating publicly that the town of Auburn will not be enforcing the new law. I have seen the chief quoted saying, there is little incentive for police to enforce the law, nor am I planning to get the ability to do that. And articles such as the Telegram and Gazette say he thinks he, it's the worst law ever enacted in Massachusetts. New England Cable News ran a television piece with the heading, Police Chief Refuses to Enforce the New Marijuana Law. I have serious concerns as to why these comments would be made publicly. It certainly does not help the town of Auburn as being known as a pot safe haven. It is a clear violation of the oath of office taken by the chief, and I would further wonder if the chief is within his power to ignore the laws and refuse to enforce them because he disagrees with them. 
This story was picked up and has been published in the Boston Globe, the Associated Press, Yahoo News, WAAF, WBZ, New England Cable News, Telegram and Gazette, and several national marijuana advocacy magazines. Essentially, we've publicly invited every pothead from here to Seattle to come to Auburn and smoke marijuana without any repercussion. Further, it was detailed in several articles that the offender could just lie to the police about their name, assuming no other infraction were committed at that time. I'm not sure how this helps our patrolmen in doing their jobs. I liken it to telling a robber how to bypass the security system. The Chief's oath of office is as follows. To solemnly swear that he will bear true faith and allegiance to the United States of America and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And he will support the Constitution and laws thereof, so help him God. Calling a law a train wreck, the worst law ever, and refusing to enforce it is hardly what I consider supporting the laws. This oath mentions the Constitution of the United States, the single most important document in all this land. It's no accident that the first three words of the Constitution are, we the people. And a vote of two to one in favor of this law is a mandate and is reflective of, we the people. And should we be respected like it or not? The oath continues to accept the office of Chief of Police Force of the Town of Auburn and agree to obey and be bound by such rules and regulations as are or may be from time to time laid down for the government of the Police Department of the Town of Auburn and to carry out his duties as Chief faithfully and partially and to the best of his abilities. The police, the policy of not enforcing the law, coupled with the public comments, exhibit neither impartialness nor faithfulness. This is of great concern to me. I recognize police officers are faced with a very difficult decision on a daily basis and oftentimes use their discretion. This is not the same. A unilateral announcement of refusing to enforce the law goes far beyond an officer's discretion, as officers are not even given discretion as to whether or not to enforce this law. The government has a system of checks and balances. It is the role of the police to issue tickets to those in possession of less than an ounce of marijuana. That's what, that's what question two stated. What happens after that in determining how to enforce the ticket is irrelevant to the issuance of the ticket. As we have all heard the phrase, tell it to the judge. In summation, contrary to the numerous articles written, gaining moderate national attention, marijuana is not legal in Auburn. Whether you agree with the law or not, it is not a reason to unilaterally and publicly announce refusal to enforce the law. I'm sure the merits and deficiencies of this law will be worked out in legislative and judicial branches but it should not be worked out in the police department. No one is above the law. Thank you. Well, I think first of all, I'd have to inquire as to where, where you obtained that. Obtain what? The statement that you just read. I where wrote did, it. Where did that come from? I wrote it. You wrote it? I wrote this. Well, I, uh, I will say to you uh, that, that there were several articles that <clears throat> been written by others um, that pertain to this specific law, which, which in fact is a train wreck, dis despite um, your your disbelief in that. Um, if, if you'd allow me to read the following uh, from the mayor of the city of Worcester, Mrs. Luke said there is no significant. Uh, I'm sorry, she said there is significant confusion on how to implement question two, without changing the original intent of the referendum. There are so many exceptions, and its lack of clarity virtually renders it ineffective. Mrs. Luke said something needs to be done at the state level to set uniform standards for all communities. Uh, in an interview with uh, the uh, head of the Department of Public Safety, Public Safety and Security Secretary Kevin Burke said the state is recommending communities pass their own ordinances against public pot smoking. Juveniles caught under, with under an ounce are supposed to undergo drug education. But Burke said that there currently isn't a program to refer people to. He says a variety of state agencies are working to develop that program, which is required by the new law, but that there is little money and no immediacy for the program. Massachusetts officially decriminalized possession of small amounts of marijuana yesterday. 
but many police departments across the state were essentially ignoring the voter pass law, saying they would not even bother to ticket people they see smoking marijuana. We're just basically not enforcing it right now, said Mark Arlaventure, chief of police in Clinton, a central Massachusetts town of about 8,000, who said the law was so poorly written that it cannot be enforced. You probably have a lot of officers that, unless there's a caller complaining about it, won't even bother with it. They probably handled a lot of it informally before, and probably more so now. Um, this, this law has, has major, major flaws. Um, I, I take exception with the fact that you, uh, that you infer that I neglect my, my position as, as chief of police. I am quite mindful of my position as chief of police, and although my job is to enforce the law, my all, job is also to protect the town. And I'm also mindful of what our insurance deductible is should we get sued. Under this law, if there's somebody that is smoking a marijuana cigarette and the police officer goes over with a, with a civil fine, which in and of itself is, is, a, is a problem, this is a copy of what the state has put together. There's no carbon copies, there's, there's no photocopies, there's, it's, it's substandard to say the least. There needs to be some sort of a uniform citation like there are for uh, traffic tickets. However, if the officer went over and attempted to identify the person who was smoking marijuana and the person didn't want to give their name, they don't have to. So if the person said, my name is Nicholas Hammond, that's who they make the citation out to, to, to Nicholas Hammond. Now, when Nicholas Hammond receives a citation in the mail because it has to be mailed within uh, 20 days, uh, he's probably not going to be too happy if he decided to sue the town Irregardless of whether we won or lost, the town's still on the hook for the deductible from our insurance carrier. For the, for the $100 fine, until these, these issues are addressed, I don't think it's worth enforcing. I don't think it's worth putting the town in that type of a, of a position of liability. I would rather wait until we get some direction from the state. And although, although I agree that we, we need to to act diligently, we need to act cautiously as well. Now, let's assume for the sake of argument that, that the, the individual who's smoking gives his or her true name. If 30 seconds later they decide to throw that citation that they've just been given in the trash, they're completely allowed to do so. There is uh, no mechanism whatsoever for the court to collect that fine. So you're, in essence, handing out a ticket for $100 to someone that they don't have to pay. I, f I fail to see the logic in that type of enforcement. I think police officers are given a, a lot of latitude and have wide discretion in how they can conduct themselves each and every single day. Just because somebody gets stopped for speeding, they don't necessarily get a speeding ticket. I don't think that that is, is neglecting their, their positions. I think, it's, I think it's using common sense. And I think it's, it's having some discretion and um, trying to make a determination if somebody has a lengthy driver's history and if, if a citation is required. Um, the, the $100 fine is the equivalent in Auburn of, of getting a parking ticket for parking in a handicapped space. Uh, as it stands right now, the I should say, as, as of last Thursday, the drug lab where we submit all of our drug evidence to, they, have they had received one. They probably do 35 cities and towns in the area, one analysis for marijuana. And that came from right here, from the town of Auburn. We were the only ones. We're not ignoring the, the large uh, marijuana issues. Far from it. The female officer who you saw standing here earlier tonight, she arrested somebody with a pound of marijuana going down Route 20, going 55 miles an hour in a 40 mile an hour zone. Those cases aren't being ignored. If we were turning a blind eye to, to cases like that, then I could understand your statement, but that's not even remotely the case, not even remotely true. In fact, the drug lab has said, if you send us under an ounce of marijuana to have it analyzed, 
so that you can proceed with, with your $100 citations. We're going to send it back to you. We're not analyzing it. Don't send it. We don't want it. We're not going to do it. So I think that until all of the problems are worked out of this law, and I have three pages of three pages of proposed changes that the Mass Chiefs of Police are going to submit to the legislature that are deficiencies in the law. Uh, I think those need to be instituted, um, and I'm sure they'll come to some sort of an agreement, and uh, the legislation will get filed and will get passed in, in one form or another. The other issue that I take exception with is the issue of enforcement. It appears the town meeting passed section 21 of chapter 40 back on May 5th of 1975. It is unclear whether or not they had adopted section D of that statute. Section D of that statute is what allows you to issue a citation under this new law. So I don't even know if, we, if we've adopted the statute where we could do that even if I wanted to do it. So th there are many things that, that still need to be done that need to be looked at carefully, and I emphasize carefully, before we go ahead and start handing out $100 tickets to people. Um, it's, it's probably not going to be resolved until the spring. And I, based upon those issues, I have no intention of having my offices hand out $100 tickets to people who have a small amount of marijuana as we sit here today. When something changes, then I'll be more than happy to address it. Mr. Hammond? The first quote was from who? You quoted Luke's? The first quote? Yeah, the mayor of the city of Worcester. Yes. Yeah, they're enforcing the law. They have the tickets. They, they, they said they will be enforcing this. As much as they don't like it, they're enforcing it. There are two towns that will not enforce this law that have been stated, Clinton and Auburn. 349 other municipalities have come out against this law with the same concerns Chief Lucas has had. I, I agree with all of them. I agree with every concern, but we're arguing the deficiencies of the law to an oath of office saying that even if I don't like the law, I will uphold this law with impartialness or nor, faith, nor faithful, faithfulness. Clearly, the statements made show partial. He doesn't like the law. Well, Mr. Hammond, I can I, tell you that I've spoken to Can I speak? Sure. Thank you. Um, there is a difference between possession versus consumption. Under the law, under Article 2, and I didn't want to get into this, but the debate, but we're turning it from the oath of office and the theory of upholding the law, whether you like it or not, to the deficiencies of the law. Under Article 2, it clearly states, nothing contained herein shall prohibit a political subdivision, which would be Auburn, of the Commonwealth from enacting ordinances, bylaws, regulating and prohibiting consumption of marijuana. So I, I would equate that to an open container law or public drunkenness, something to that effect, which I think you had mentioned you started working on a law. Let's not confuse possession, which this law made civil, and consumption, which this did not address. The problem with it is, because of marijuana possession was always legal, consumption was never addressed, because if you had it, you were going to jail. I'm sorry, what was that last part? Because the law made it illegal to possess. There were no laws enacted for consumption, because possession would have put you in jail. So it doesn't say, well, you can legally have pot, but you can't smoke it. The, the law doesn't exist. Why? Because, well, if you had it, you were going to jail, whether you were smoking it or not. Now, now that's changed. The no-name thing. I've heard this a lot, and I agree. If you're sitting there with this joint in your pocket and you give no name, one, if you have the audacity to lie to a cop and he doesn't hook you for disturbing the peace um, or loitering, I'd be shocked. Second, as I've read most of these articles in the paper, they are usually accompanied by another infraction, i.e. speeding, driving, um, something, stealing. Everyone has been accompanied. So in this case, if someone's driving down the road, with a joint in their car, we're still not ticketing them, even though we have the ability to ascertain their name and all their information. In terms of enforcement of the law, whether or not the law is enforceable or not, it doesn't fall in the jurisdiction of the police department. That falls under the jurisdiction of the courts, 
the judicial branch. There may not be anything, there may not be any cause right now to enforce it, but I'm sure they will. And it does not preclude the police department from doing its job with impartialness to the law. I agree with everything he said in terms of the deficiencies, and I fully support his, I actually made a motion to create a, a laws for the consumption. But the oath is very clear, and if you care to read it, I would encourage you to. I, I still don't understand why we went public. These are all concerns, these are all great concerns, but to go public and say, hey, if you, Bob Johnson from Gloucester, and you smoke pot at the mall, we're not going to give you a ticket or anything. A policy better probably kept not to the nation. The city of Worcester is enforcing this law. They have the ticket books. The city of Boston is enforcing this law. They don't like it. They have the ticket books. Bill Ricker is enforcing this law. Springfield is enforcing this law. Everyone is enforcing this law with the exception of two towns. Two. Clinton and Auburn have publicly come out and said we are not enforcing this law. I don't know if it's within the police powers to decide what laws they do and do not enforce. That is not the same as discretion when at the scene based on certain circumstances. This is a unilateral, wide-sweeping policy of not enforcing the law. I, I thought the legislator made the law, the judicial were to interpret it, and the police were to enforce and execute it. There is a major difference between discretion and a unilateral policy of not enforcing the law. So let's not confuse those two. Chief? I, I would agree. Let, let's not confuse the two. Between the city of Worcester, the city of Boston, and the city of Springfield, how many citations have they issued for smoking marijuana? That's the, I, I, like I said, I don't want to debate with you. They've come out publicly and said, if you smoke marijuana in our, in our city, we will give you a ticket through the fullest extent of the law. What happens after is not our concern. We think the law stinks. There's a lot of problems, but you're going to get a ticket. The town of Auburn said, we think the law stinks, so come to Auburn, smoke weed, and we promise you we won't give you a ticket. So, so I think the, the difference there probably is they've probably issued almost zero tickets like us. Only I have publicly said that we're not going to. They, they have, they have public, publicly said they're going to, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to it's in the, major, in the yeah, real world. It's a major concern going public with such a policy. That, it's factual. I think it's you, you may have a concern with think, it, but it's I factual. Think it's, I think it's out of your power to ignore a law. If you thought rape was stupid, could you ignore that law? Murder, could you ignore that law? I mean, where does it end? It's a slippery, I know these are extremes, but it's a slippery slope. At what point does a law that you disagree with go, I'm not going to enforce that one? Speeding's not illegal today. In, in Massachusetts, there is one law that says the police shall. This law says it. Shall. Of course. I have it highlighted. The police department serving each political subdivision of the Commonwealth shall enforce Section 32L in a manner consistent with non-criminal disposition provisions of Section 21D of Chapter 40 of the General Laws as modified. The person in charge, that would be you, of each such department shall direct the department's public safety officer or another appropriate member of the department to function as a liaison between the department and persons providing drug awareness programs pursuant to 32M of this chapter in clerk magistrate's office in the district clerk serving the political sub subdivision. This person shall, in charge, shall also issue books of non-criminal citation forms to the department offices which conform with the provisions of section 21D 40 chapter general law. And when the provisions of the law are, are tightened and the, the amendments are made, I, as I said earlier, I would be happy to come to town meeting with a recommendation for a bylaw change, and then we, will be, we shall do that. I'll be happy to do that at that time. Again, I don't see that qualifier in the law voted on by the people. I mean, that's my concern here. I don't see that qualifier. I know it's a bad law. I agree with you 100%. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying I don't think you have the discretion to unilaterally say we're not enforcing that law, and I question that. And it's certainly, I mean, a violation of the oath you took to uphold the law with impartialness and faithfulness to support the Constitution, and, and to enforce the laws laid down by the land. Not, so were so you saying you want me to issue violation notices or books to someone for a law that may be changed in two weeks and spend money 
printing that for a, a statute that I don't even know that the town has adopted. The state's adopted it. It's very, it's very explicit. I mean, I don't know how you have the authority to say, I don't like the law. And if I'm wrong, please tell me. I don't like this law. I'm not enforcing it. I just don't see it. Furthermore, that's the, the biggest issue I have is we went publicly and told everyone. National News, Associated Press picked this up. I read it on Yahoo News, front page. Auburn police will not enforce the law. NECN, police chief refuses to enforce the law. A month ago we sat here, I asked you when you wanted to do cruises, I said, how many cruises do you have on at any given time? You didn't feel comfortable answering that, and I understood. That's, that's, yep, that's correct. This, I think, is more egregious than saying I have four or five cruises on it. I mean, this is beyond. Um, we can go back and forth all night, Chief. I, I, I understand what you're saying, and, and, and principally I agree. I agree. So all the key facts you said, I agree with. There's deficiencies. But I don't know how the deficiencies in legislature in the judicial branch authorize you as an executive branch to ignore it. You just write the ticket, and whatever happens, I mean, you just that's my job, write the ticket. What you guys do with it, I don't care. Whether a guy gets off on DUI or not, it's irrelevant to you. As long as you locked them up because you had I, I think we need significant clarification from the state before we proceed. I don't think it's prudent at this time to, to proceed. Got Mr. Westman. Hey, Chief, I, just a couple uh, quick uh, questions for you. Is there any age on this, uh, I mean, you know, for the person, is there any age for the person who has the marijuana on them? There is, there is no age. The, the only thing that it address with, addresses with respect to age is anyone that's under 18. Um, they have to be sent to a drug treatment program, and their parents have to be notified. So in other words, we can get a kid going to grammar school. He can walk into school and have a joint, and there's nothing much you can do about it? Other than that, no. It's a good law. <laughs> there, is, there is no drug programs for people that are under 18. That, that's what I was trying to get at. Go ahead. The schools would have the authority to enforce that through expulsion, anything they wanted. They can enforce that. They, they need, and this was in part of my motion, they need to reevaluate their drug enforcement policies to make up for the deficiency of this law, where a one year expulsion for possession would be, con you know, constitute something. Yeah, but the problem further, is they haven't got it now. Further, without issuing those tickets, I mean, we're supposed to notify the parents. I have two little kids. I know some people up here, I would like to know if my kid got caught driving around with a dime bag of weed. And if we're not issuing tickets, we're not going to know as parents. So when it's for the kids, it's really for the kids. That has nothing to do with the $100 fine. If I issue you a ticket, I get to call mommy. And because you're in a car, I get to know your name. That, that Mr. Hammond, that, that's something that, that we, we did routinely right prior to the implementation of this legislation. That is the law right now. It actually gives you the... Everything. We, we did it before. You, you don't need a lot to figure out that somebody that's 12 years old with marijuana probably has to have a parent notified. And that's, that's what's part of this law. We and didn't, we didn't need this help. to do that, is my point. And a $1,000 fine and drug housing. Which, for which there is no funding and there are no programs in place. Yeah, and that's, that's for the legislature and judicial branch to figure out. Mr. Miller. You can't. They won't test it. Well, if we just say they did, or we'll say it was three ounces now. I mean, is there a basic charge for analysis? No, it's the state lab. The state pays for it. That does not cost us money. Nope. Ms. Pappas? Yes. Yeah. Can you come up to the... There's no one can hear you. Chief Lucas, I just have a question for you. Um, by not enforcing this law, what does that teach the kids in our community? Because I personally, as the Recreation and Culture Director, um, teach drug-free, um, stay fit, stay positive, be it, lead a healthy, healthy, happy life. So by not enforcing this law and making it public and national, it personally, as a parent of a freshman in high school, it seems like it gives the kids the green light that it's okay. And I think the biggest thing as a parent and a community leader and, and someone in your position to not take the stance that, you know what, drugs are bad and we shouldn't allow our kids to do it. And, and if the state passes a, a law and, and you publicly don't enforce it, 
my only concern is the kids in our community and letting them think that that's okay. Because, you know, for what adults do, it's different, but the kids are our future. And, and if you're not enforcing um, a law in, in letting us parents know if my kid, like Nick, if your kid was in a car, I, I just, it blows my mind that you wouldn't protect our kids to enforce that. Mm -hmm. You're, you're, you're absolutely correct with, with respect to um, notifying parents when, when their kids have marijuana, which is, which is what we have done and which is what we still continue to do today. Um, the, the, voters, the voters sent a, a strong message when they passed this referendum that they wanted to decriminalize marijuana, and it is decriminalized. The, the most that we could do is issue them a $100 fine which we are not doing now, but we will be doing in the springtime after we have proper language formulated that's been approved in May. I have a quick question for Mr. O'Connor. Um, regards to the ticket bill that this is gonna have to go on to. When I was here, we have the ticket bill, we've put it into, into place. I'm not sure about that section D or not, but prior to issuing any citations like I did for a fire prevention it had to be accepted that whatever I wanted to do had to be accepted by town meeting in a list is that the same case with this doesn't this have to be added to that before you can even do anything through the chair the chief has expressed that there's a question regarding that doesn't state law supersede if there's no, no law to the contrary no because it, they're, they're saying that you have to use a ticket bill that we use now like like the chief, uh, the, like chief, why not use it that I had? If we go in and do we do a fire prevention check on a building and there's a violation, they choose not to fix it. We could give them a citation for 50 bucks, 100 bucks, or whatever, and that went into the, to the clerk. Okay, that's the same ticket bill that they put this under. And in order for me to do that at the time, and in order for chief, why not to do it? He has to list like chapter 48 uh, or whatever laws that we're going to have to list it, and it goes before town meeting, and it's approved by town meeting. And then, and only then, could you start issuing citations. I think that's one of the biggest flaws here, is that they don't have that. I firmly disagree 100%. The well, I don't law, care if you disagree or not. The state law is very clear that this... They, you, but read it, the state law. The read, state law says great. that you use the citation book, it and does, you have to do that. Right, read the it citation. Says it right here, it says exactly, and there's also a question and answer from the Attorney General, which specifies that it can be done under state law. Well, I mean, I, I, think, you'll it, find, I think you'll find that it has to go before town meeting to add it. Everybody to else is enforcing this, and nobody... I mean, Boston's doing it, Worcester's doing it. Auburn and Clinton are the only ones who think it can't be done. So we have 349 other chiefs who say, I hate the law, but I'm going to do it because it's my job. I took an oath to uphold the law whether I like it or not. And, and here we're thinking of every way not to enforce it because we hate the law and it's incomplete. I, if Boston can do it, maybe we should call Chief Jem and uh, Worcester can do it. We'll call Chief Jem and find out how to do it. Or we'll call the Boston chief and they find out how to do it. Um, I mean, they have a they charter. Have they have a charter. They have bylaws. They have a council. All they have to do is go before a council. Uh, Worcester council, Worcester council has not brought this up. They started talking about it. Made took no action. It's being enforced in Worcester. I've I've checked on everything under the guidance of the attorney general. This is enforceable, and you can do it. Now maybe it gets thrown on the judicial branch. Maybe it does. But what does that have to do with the issuance? Because the law says it should be issued. I mean. Uh, I find it difficult to issue any type of a citation, criminal or civil to someone that you have absolutely no way of identifying. I, I have, a, okay. I have a, a, an issue with that. I, I truly I'll, do. I'll, I'll play devil's advocate. I'll buy into that. You said unilaterally we're not issuing tickets. So let's assume a kid is sitting there, you, you stop him for nothing, you search him and find weed. Let's forget about this, you know, the Fourth Amendment, but you find weed with no other infraction. Yeah, he can lie to you if he has the audacity to. I was a kid. I wouldn't lie. <laughs> Probably the kids from around here, the teacher, the, the cop probably knows who it is anyway. Regardless, let's throw all that out. If someone's in a car, you have every right to know their name. Yes? Of course. You, you have a right to ask them for their name. If they say to you, I have no identification, or they don't want to tell you. They've if, committed a motor vehicle violation. You're talking about a, a driver, not somebody that's in a car. If someone's in a car, motor vehicle violation. 
they have to identify themselves too. We don't have the ticket books. We're not going to ticket them because we didn't get the book. So there will be certain, and this is where police discretion comes in. I don't know the kid's name. He could be lying to me. So I'm not going to ticket him, but I got the book. Whereas I just pulled him over for speeding. Not only is he getting a speeding in ticket, I found a, I found a joint in his glove box, so he's getting a ticket too. That argument doesn't hold for that. Now, every article I've read in the newspaper since this law has been enacted is it has come on the, on the auspice of another infraction, even in Auburn. Speeding, so, some way to identify the individual. Now, there will be those instances where, for some reason, some kid's walking around holding weed or has it stapled to his hat or something, but ch chances are you're going to need a reason to search him, which probably is the infraction where you're going to get their name. Like what? You tell me stealing, uh, shoplifting, speeding, loitering, disturbing the peace, but all the things that I used to get busted up for when I was a kid. You, I mean, I, cops, uh, let's be realistic. Cops ask you your name, you tell them. <laughs> if you don't, I would, uh, you're going to jail for something. Disturbing the peace, disorderly conduct, loitering, something. You're going to get something. Do you know what that leads to? Disorderly and disturbing the peace, that leads to people going to court, getting found not guilty because, because it's a, a trumped-up headhunting charge. I understand that. I which, agree. Which leads to notification within the next five years that you're being sued. That's what disorderly and disturbing the peace leads I'm to. I'm not disagreeing with you, but the, the, um, what I'm saying is the auspice of not being able to find out the case. Well, I have no intention of headhunting to, to, to increase... Uh, marijuana civil citations. No one's asking you because to. because it very well may lead to what you just said. No one's at, what I'm asking you to do is when you have a get the books, when someone gets pulled over for speeding and you find a nickel bag, you and every officer is prepared to issue a citation. What happens after that is irrelevant. No one's asking you to headhunt. No one's asking you for anything. If a kid's walking down the street and got a pocket a weed in his pocket, you wouldn't have known it anyway. If someone wants to sit at home and get high to the sky, I could care less. What you do in your home is your own business. But you need re uh, you, chances are there's going to be an infraction that comes along with this possession charge, which will allow you to identify the name. I highly doubt that there is very many cases where some kid just gets pinched for possessing weed and didn't do anything else. How the hell would you even know to search? How could you search? It would depend on what the circumstances were. Exactly. If a kid's doing nothing and has marijuana in his pocket, you're not going to know it, never mind his name. You have no reason to stop him or search him. It's a Fourth Amendment issue at that point. We can argue oh, back. Totally, I totally agree. It is a Fourth Amendment so, issue. So at this, I mean, the law is clear. We agree that the law is deficient. There's a lot of holes. The Mass Police Chiefs Association has identified many of them and will be sending it to the legislator. I'm sure they will be quick to enact. With that being said, the law is the law. You can't just ignore it because you don't like it. Publicly saying that we're not going to enforce this law is even more damaging, in my opinion, than anything we could have done. I think that, I think that we have... We have latitude and discretion in this law as we do with, with, with other laws. Discretion means I'll apply it when it fits and I won't. Not, I won't apply it to anyone because I, I just think it's stupid. It's a train wreck. That's discretion. I'll apply it when it seems to make sense and I won't when I win. So I don't know how discretion is. Well, I don't like that law, so I'm not going to enforce it. That's how I'm hearing. And I've read all the articles and watched the TV shows. And it said it's a train wreck. I'm not enforcing this law under any circumstances. We're not getting the books. We don't have an incentive to enforce the law. Not doing it. That's, that's just a unilateral I'm not paying attention to that law. Discretion is, well, I, you could be lying to me, kid, so I'm not going to give you a ticket. Whereas, I mean, but you're, you're the chief. But with that, I move that this board publicly disagree with the chief's policy of not enforcing the marijuana law as written, voted on and approved by the voters. I love that this board supports kids smoking weed and not having their parents known. I move to request the opinion of the Attorney General inquiring if the Chief is even within his authority to set policy of not enforcing a law unilaterally. Well, we've got two different motions. Well, the first one got nothing. Uh, well, I didn't ask for a second. Anyone? Second the first motion? Okay, we're going to the second. It's for the kids, huh? I move the board adopt a resolution supporting a supporting act in making consumption of marijuana in public a criminal offense allowed 
allowing the Town of Auburn to enact a series of bylaws which will establish a sensible marijuana policy as allowed under question two. These laws should focus solely on the consumption of marijuana, not possession. As Mr. Slukas has clearly stated, there are certain deficiencies. We should let that work out, but it does carve out consumption. A second on that motion. So, so my, my my question to you, Nick, is is that is that the same? I'm not sure what law he has. Is that the same issue that you're bring, That is that the same law you're planning on bringing to? Because I think we would support. I I, I what would, you're doing going to town meeting. I would support some form of that. However, I would respectfully request this law is in its infancy. It's only ten days old. I would really like to wait and see what other communities do, what the Attorney General approves, what the legislature approves, and go from there in May. I think that they may come up with language that is far superior than any one of us can come up with at 940 at, at, at night at a selectman's meeting. If they don't have better language, then I'd be more than happy to accept Mr. Hammond's language. But I'd at least like to look and language. see what's out there. I don't want to write it. I just want to, I want to get it going. Ms. Westman? Uh, this, this is going to go back and forth all night, but uh, what I'd like to see is, you know, in 10 days, they're going to finally put it together, the law. It's been, it's been 10 days. It's, it's, it's yeah. going to take a little longer than that to yeah, play well, out. Whatever it takes, we get it from, you know, from the state. I'll be happy to pass along everything I get to the board. Because it doesn't make sense to me, and I agree with you. You don't even know how old the kids can be. So if you get a three-year-old kid walking down the street with a joint, that's all well and good. It just doesn't make sense. So I just assume wait till they get the legislation done the right way. I think this board, how many have read this law in its entirety before you even vote? How many know the actual intricacies of this law? I believe you should read it. Because in this it says that only subdivisions can enact laws. Now why there may be guidelines, which there already are, established by the Attorney General for Bylaws, that's fine, but it, it clearly carves out that the state cannot enact the laws. The, the subdivisions has to, and I have it here. So we can wait till we're blue in the face for the state to enact the law. They can't do anything about the possession. And, and it clearly says consumption. Now you can wait before all these Supreme Court hearings to go on, but there's a law that's already written that says the police chief shall administer $100 fines. If, if it clarifies things, Mr. Hammond, I can tell you that there was already a meeting last Thursday. Um, this, is a, this is a priority for uh, everyone in law enforcement, and I believe it's a priority for the governor's office, and I believe it's a priority for the legislature as well. Um, I, I don't see them sitting on their hands with respect to this law. I, I see them doing something. There, there are guidelines out by the attorney general on how to write the bylaws. I've read them. I, I have out. a draft copy. Yeah. So what do I mean? What, 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 uh, they're already out. So, I mean, I'm making a motion. Now, there's two separate issues here. Possession, which is what this law really addresses, and then consumption, which basically says towns can do what towns feel they want to do. My motion, my final motion, is to establish a set of laws for the consumption. It, when I have... When I have language that is not in draft form, I'd be happy to report back to the board and present it to you for, for your, your input and or your vote. I don't have that yet. The, 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 the memo that's put up from the Attorney General's office isn't clear as to whether or not it can be an arrestable offense or whether or not it has to be an additional fine. It doesn't, it doesn't answer the question. That question is still lingering out there. And there are attorneys who are debating this who have varying views as to which is permissible. And I don't know, and neither do they. Right. So maybe we should get started on looking at all this stuff. And, what, you know, and I mean, that's my proposal is let's get started. What are, are you, we waiting for? I mean, you have a copy of the first draft. There is starting to become opinions. If the, board, mean, if the board wants to vote to authorize, I'd be happy to contact Mr. Hennigan tomorrow morning to get the ball rolling, if, that, if that's the wish of the board. I'm shocked that this board is going to allow kids to smoke weed walking in schools with no concern. I'd rather see the kid challenge the law in court than to allow that to happen. But by inaction of this board, to allow kids to sit at the mall, to publicly say and to have no opinion on it is, is absurd. It's absurd. Mr. Valentine. 
I, I just want to state that instead of no opinion, Mr. Hammond, you don't have five Mr. Hammonds up here. And what this member is doing is saying the man I trust on this issue is standing in front of that podium right there, and he's who we hired to do this job. And take and, this oath of office. And that's who I'm trusting to be doing the right thing here. The fact that he may have been uh, vocal about the fact that this law needs to be fixed quickly, maybe helping it get that's, fixed quickly, rather than said. other members of town, other members in other towns, which apparently, if we understand that, on, that only one uh, it was even sent in for to be checked. Other other police chiefs may have not made any public comments, but haven't done a thing about it either. So they're just electing to not say anything, or claim they're going to have their officers do things that they're not actually doing. I don't see that as any more honorable than than taking a stand and saying I'm going to help work this out and I'm going to work on it. So please don't characterize other board members as somehow less than Mr. Hammond. Because, and we somehow don't believe in children when we've demonstrated for years an ability and a desire to work with children, and in this particular case, a trust in our in the chief of police. I urge you to read the oath of the chief of police and, and, and write down the amount of violations of stating that I'm going to ignore a law has occurred. I urge you. I urge you to read the law. And as I stated, is, when it is tightened up, we will implement it. There's no qualifier. And question two that the vote is mandated for a there's a 60 day window stated by statute that is passed the law is in force the law should be in force mr hammond i'm telling you what i think is best for the town if you choose to ignore my advice you're certainly entitled to can i at least get a uh, a public acknowledgement that announcing this from here to seattle was not of the best decision making we, now we want to let the process go forward. But two weeks ago, we just wanted to tell the whole world that we're not enforcing the law. Why are we allowing this debate to go any further? I was just about to say, does the board wish to take action, to have, take action or wait until, until such time that it's, the law is clarified and, and uh, then the chief will follow the, those actions? Because the, 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 I, I can see the point that uh, Mr. Hammond is making, but the cost factor that is involved in initiating something that might be temporary is, uh, is foundless, and, and we shouldn't go uh, in that direction until we have some concrete uh, information on the law. And even though you spoke out, uh, you know, you're being penalized for it or cited for it, and uh, rather than the other 349 that haven't said anything that are waiting until such time that something is brought forward and then they'll either enforce or not enforce. So uh, if the board so wishes, I'll address a motion to, uh, to continue until such time that we have a ruling from the, uh, we'll be coming from the DA's office. Uh, from the uh, the House Senate, I think it's. I think he said it was going to re be refined legislation. That the Chiefs were submitting some. They, they were okay. So the Chiefs Association. As soon as I have something, I'll be happy to bring it in. Okay. So moved. Second. Uh, discussion. Uh, Mr. Hammond. What? Well. There's a motion and a second. Yes no. or no? No. Mr. Valentine. Yes. Mr. Gribbins. Yes. Mr. Westman. Yes. Mr. Grossman, yes, 4 to 1. Thank you very much. Uh, next agenda item 9F GIC. Uh, do you have something additional to carry? No, sir. That was already addressed. We already addressed. Yeah, okay. Uh, under old business, uh, school projects, street, street acceptance procedure, Veterans Memorial Corridor, Cemetery Land. Conflict of interest policy, Barbara Ave, School Buildings Committee, Schedule 19, all no change. Uh, item H, FY 2010 budget guidance. This item was continued from the last meeting. We have copies from the departments in response to the board's vote of October 6th. Also enclosed are departmental responses to the board's vote to request a list of all new positions created in the last three fiscal years. Uh, 
Any comments from board members? I believe this should be a tool used in the budgeting process, usually the newly created positions. And I don't want to jump ahead. should be looked at to see, you know, what, what the need is for them. Um, it's just another tool. There's no, don't read into it, but I think we need to look at all tools, and this is one of them. Okay, is that in the form of a motion? Hmm? And, no, just, oh, you know, information okay. for Ed and anyone else who wants to partake in the budget process. Okay, anyone have anything else to add? Uh, Mr. Valentine. Uh, I, too, as Nick said, appreciate the time it took for people to pull this information together and to make these recommendations. And I want to make sure, because we tend to have a relatively high-level oversight uh, requirement on the budget, I want to make sure that this information, and I assume it is, but just to make sure that I'm comfortable knowing this information is in the hands of the people who are going to be working through this budget, uh, not only with the administration, but is it also going to be made available to the Finance Committee so that they're aware of this level of detail as well, and they can take it into, in, you know, into account of their line item, uh, their line item review. Okay. Any other comments? No. Okay, moving on. To agenda item 11, legislative issues, are there any? Someone say something? No. Stand. I just I wanted to bring up the, the, the concept of um, special legislation. I know Mr. Grimms brought it up for meals tax, um, potentially an increase of a hotel tax. In my uh, packet that I sent, I also had uh, some theories of sin tax, for instance, alcohol and cigarettes for a local tax. I understand that these in past have not been well received on the Hill, uh, <clears throat> but in light of the current fiscal finance, I wonder if this board feels that it might be worth taking another shot at any or all of them. The meals and restaurant tax, I believe, is under discussion right now by the uh, by the Senate or the, the House. First time the governor is supporting it. So. Yeah, that was brought up about two years ago. If I don't yeah, yeah, the times have changed. The yeah. committee. So uh, that one is is being discussed right now to uh, pass I, it on to yeah. the town. And I, and I, th I think the one other that uh, we, we probably, the time is right to explore it again. And we talked to Representative Foss and um, Senator Augustus about this, gosh, it must have been about two years ago, is the notion of the local impact fees that are in existence in a lot of states uh, for new developments in the community of assessing local impact fees uh, right up front with the development cost. Uh, Massachusetts has always been reluctant to, um, to consider those, but they are a way that many states are balancing the budget right now. So we might want to put that, I shouldn't say I want, we might, we should put that in front of our, um, uh, our legislators again, the, the notion of local impact fees. Yeah, I would be in favor of that. This board so wish yeah. to submit a letter to uh, the representatives. Uh, anything else on legislative? Uh, miscellaneous? I have one issue. Uh, one thing you all, everyone has read about is the firefighter that got killed in Boston this week as a result of faulty brakes. And they began an inspection of their vehicles in Boston. The first truck that was brought in today had bad brakes. And I think that behooves us, and I hope we're uh, taking a look at our, our uh, vehicles to make sure that they're in working condition, not only the fire department, but any of the larger vehicles in the highway department are also uh, uh, in top condition and that they're not out on the roads uh, being a hazard to uh, <clears throat> some resident that might be dr driving down the street and have one of these vehicles coming at them out of control. Bob, might I add just one other issue? Yeah. Just a, a, a couple of citizen calls uh, relating to the trash um, collection. Uh, if we could just send a note to them, and I just happened to notice on a Friday as well, is when they, um, when they spill on the street that they clean up after it. Um, there's a lot of litter that I'm getting complaints about in, in terms of particularly recyclables as they're dumping them in that some items are not going in the truck and they're littering the neighborhoods and they're not picking them up. So if we could just send a note along, that would be great. Okay, Mr. Hammond. Uh, I'd like to make a motion that um, we ask for a joint meeting. It was actually, we could probably do, you know, uh, informal discussion, but a joint meeting with the Finance Committee 
to reevaluate the mileage reimbursement rate in light of the sharp declines of gas prices. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Do you want to pick a date? No, you want to check with them first? They are a little busier than us, I yeah. think, in terms of meetings. So, well, I think we should work around that. Okay. Uh, no. We'll take a, uh, a five minute recess before we go into our executive session. We, we, I need a motion to go into executive session uh, in accordance with Mass General Laws, Chapter 39, Section 23B, to deliberate on matters which done in an open meeting could detrimentally affect the position of the town regarding strategy with respect to collective bargaining and litigation to come out of executive session only to adjourn. So, so moved. moved. Second. Uh, Mr. Hammond? Yes. Mr. Valentine? Yes. Mr. Evans? Yes. Mr. Grossman? Yes. Mr. Grossman, yes. Thank you.